So right now we're going to look at all of the photos that we have. I've tried to separate them and sort them so that I can give you all of the different photos that we have of the front of the house, back of the house, west side, east side, etc, etc, room by room based on all of the photos that we have from the Apple Valley Police Department and from the BCA. We're starting here at the front of the house. Good thing to note is the snow. Note where those presents are. It's very important, very important to know the distance of this window here and how high you would have to be up to actually see anything on the ground or to actually see where those bodies were or to even possibly see where the blood writing was. It's not as easy as some might think. So again, this is just the front of the house that we're covering here in this section based on all of the photos that we have. Not in particular order, but I try to give it some type of order here. And you can see the way that the presents are laid up. This is after Colin Proc now stacked them up too. So it's not like this is how they were found. We don't really know how the presents were found. Colin Proc now knows. And maybe he stacked them up the same way that he saw them. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's very important to note that this is not exactly how the presents were found. They were more scattered based on what Colin told the cops, there were more scattered down. His presents were probably out there for about three weeks, I believe. You can see the window there, and you can see the curtain a little bit open. You see that in several of these uh, curtains here, in the window curtains, they're kind of open. Note the snow too, it's also very important to note the snow. You can see another cable going there. But you can see that the driveway, there's no snow there. How much snow is on the roof? And is this common? Is this just the way that it, that it should be? I wonder if by looking at the snow on the roof, could you get a good view, a good idea of what the snowfall was like when the last snowfall was? Obviously, you can go and you can actually look that up. Several different websites that you can look it up. Dan Hannon has looked that up. And um, I guess it really wasn't that... Uh, snow. It wasn't really snowing at this time. Snow was on the ground, but that was about it. All right. It is a common courtesy in this state to uh, blow out or to shovel your neighbor's uh, driveway. So uh, Colin Proc now did that at least once, maybe twice to this house. We're not really sure, but he didn't hear anything, didn't see anything. There was no activity in this house as far as they knew. Um, for at least before Christmas. I think Judy Procknow said the last time they had seen the Crowleys was before Christmas. Nice little town here, some nice shots. Some of the shots I don't really understand why the police took, but that's all right. You can see everything is taped up here. But again, look at those shingles. Look at how much snow is on top there. And we get another wide view, another angle here from across the street. Police cars are there. Police tape is there. It's an interesting area. It's an interesting home. If you look at the home now, if you were to compare the home how it is right now to uh, to these photos that we're looking at, um, the, there have been some major improvements, not just physically, but also spiritually from what I was told. So you can see these presents. Obviously, the big question is, well, how do the presents last for that long? And uh, they don't look soaked. They don't look wet. I mean, the bag does look wet. Everything does kind of look wet. Um, that's just my view on it. So... I don't know what type of uh, wrapping paper that would have been, but very curious to see that. Okay, thanks a lot. We've just gone through the front of the house. And we're now gonna look at the presents and the front door as well. So let's, we're gonna get a little closer up, a little closer view of those presents of how they were. Again, this is not how the presents were found, but this is how Colin Proc now stock, stacked them up at one time, Colin was going to take them back to his house, and for whatever reason, he just was going to, he stacked them up, heard the, the dog, and saw the dog attack that window. So now we're going to look at these presents. I don't want to hear any complaints about these presents. There's nothing wrong with these presents. These are great presents. There's nothing, some of that stuff really bothered me, but maybe that's just me taking it a little too personal uh, of what people say. Everybody has the freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want. So these zombie, um, zombie targets that's all normal too it's just some of the one of the zombie targets look like um uh one of the the guy that was shot in the in that bundy case but so we're looking at these presents you can see the damage of these presents here um you can see that the paper does look warped 
Yeah, there's that brown bag. And inside that brown bag is where that $14,000 check is gonna be, it, along with the bill from David's lawyer. Both of those things are in there. I think the bill is only about 500 bucks or something like that. But you can see these shooting targets. You'll see some of the same shooting targets will be found in the garage. You'll, we'll see those later. But um, very heartbreaking stuff here to really see these presents and apparently they were there for about three weeks and I know some people have raised some questions about wow they, they look really good for being there for three weeks and I would have to agree especially if those paper targets were just set up like that just set out there um, but if there's no snowfall okay and they were kind of scattered around as well that's the interesting one right there and there is another very interesting one. These zombies, I'm not sure what's up with the whole zombie thing, but inside this one is a world map. And I believe that is from Rania's grandfather. Very cool map. I actually want that map. I need a map like that. This one is an interesting toy. Um, we happened to get this for my nephew on the same year that I was looking at these photos. Um, and it is a very frustrating, very frustrating toy here. I don't know if you've ever uh, tried that but this is brain work this is good for the child's brain there was a lot of good things here um, they you know coloring crowns just the uh, I don't know okay I'm not gonna go off on some of the comments about what people have made about those presents but now we see uh, this flashlight here we're seeing some of these other gifts wounded veterans are in crisis the, the VFW um, this is a gift to Rania from um, her aunt and it, it, that's that's awesome that's great and you can see Rania draw she draws a lot right she's always drawing always got that stuff out so they got her a nice little pack there I think these presents are great uh, so I'm not <laughs> and here's that world map nice world map there and there is the invoice for 50 bucks okay I said a few hundred okay obviously it's not it was for 50 bucks to hothead productions which is David Crowley there's the front of the house. We're gonna look at the front door. They're very clear to focus. Take multiple shots of that front door and to just see no forced entry, I guess, is what they're looking for. This is one of their, um, so they believe there was no forced entry because they're looking at the door, door looks good. We're even gonna look at the inside of the door here. We're gonna come back to the inside of the door as well. You can see some shoes there. And you can see um, some of this door looks brand new some of it looks old just an interesting thing about the door and uh, they're just showing there no forced entry some scratches some marks some things like that and they're very clear to focus on that it almost looks like it was kicked in or something it's weird it's I thought that was kind of odd but that wood on the last part was kind of strange so here is the mailbox you can see this nice mailbox here for three people 1051, 1048, and 1047. And you'll notice there's only one paper in there. There's a few papers in the 1048, but only one paper, one Sun This Week newspaper. This is a weekly newspaper that was free. There should be two more. There should be one in the house, which we'll see later. There's one here that we can see, and there's two that are missing. Where are the other two? I'm very curious to see what happened with those other two and why they're not here. But as you can see, there were in 1048. So here is the mailbox that's open. You can see all the mail. How much mail does that look like? A couple weeks, two weeks, three weeks. Your guess is as good as mine. But those dates on the mail will be very, very helpful to see. And we can obviously see one more shot there of that Sun This Week paper. Here we go. This is what it looks like on the outside. January 2nd dated January 2nd, not delivered January 2nd. Very important to, to note that, we'll come back to that. All right, they pulled out some of these documents to see. And what's interesting is uh, Tara Becker was actually standing next to the mailbox when the mailman came. So it kind of gives us an idea of when the mailman would actually show up more in the, in the daytime, maybe around 1 p.m., 2 p.m. But here we have some more mail. I noticed one thing uh, here, Hothead, right? There's the Hothead Productions, 1051. Crowley, here's another one. I, I don't know who this one is from, but um, uh, it's postmarked December 29th there. So you can obviously see that. It's ripped open because the police opened it, by the way. 
Now we're going to move on to the west side of the house here. And here are the two garbages. You'll notice you saw the little uh, box there that was there that's not there anymore. And now we're looking inside of the bigger garbage as well. Still inside of that big garbage. Note the little marks to the left there. And here is the recycle garbage can, the smaller one. I'm going to open that up. There's also a couple drops on the top of that can as well. And we're going to look inside and see one, two, maybe three pieces of paper. And that's it. Maybe two. However you want to look at it. But uh, it's interesting to see how, the, how those got in there. Um, obviously, somebody put them in there. So trash date was, I believe, on Tuesdays, if I remember correctly. Dan Hannon did some great research on that. Here is that door. One of the first things that I noticed is it looked like blood on this door. It really looked like blood on this, on this doorknob. So I still go back and forth. Because it's not recorded as blood, I'm going to go ahead right now and just say, all right, well, I'm going to give the authorities the benefit of the doubt. Could be some varnish, maybe even paint. And actually, um, looking at it closer, it could be brown paint that just, but then you look at that brown paint there and it's like there were some touch-ups done. So maybe that's what it's from. You can clearly see where the touch-ups are done in this photo here. So not really blood, definitely brown paint. That would be my guess there. We're going to see two different sets of photos here. We're going to see some photos with the door slightly ajar, one fourth of an inch, and we're going to see this door fully open. And here we can see apparently there were animal tracks and human tracks, and now we get a further view of where those animal tracks and human tracks were. You can see how far back they went to take photos. Here's some deeper ones. This gives us a kind of a measure of how deep that snow was. There is the front door that is open. In the photo that we just saw, you did see Paleo. Paleo was there. He was in one of the photos there. And now, for some reason, now the door is closed. So I'm not sure exactly when this was taken, if it was before or after the dog was taken out. Not really sure, but they take photos of this as well. And I know some people have pointed out some of those red markings on that door. And so it's a little misleading. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's not the right word for it, but that's okay. I mean... Uh, that door you can clearly see right now it is closed but there's I'm not sure what those little red marks are what's going on there but it's definitely something and again it doesn't have to be blood I'm not saying it's blood but it's something it's some markings um, that's all we know for sure but we know these these photos here again I'm not really sure you can see it's they're getting darker maybe the Sun is going down and I'm not sure now the door is fully open so now with the door completely open, uh, we can just walk right in, right? So here's another extended view back there. That gives you kind of, um, kind of a good view of uh, that window and how the dog might have pawed at the window. We're now inside of the house, looking inside here, looking at that uh, door, trying to see if there's anything of value here. And I believe this again goes back to the, I'm not sure what that little piece is, that little black piece is there, but that open door was um, probably one more thing that they said, no forced entry, or because there wouldn't need to be any forced entry. Now they're looking at these shoes, calculating these shoes and getting some measurements because there were a lot of footprints in the backyard of the snow, in the back of the house. And I'm sure you all saw that. So it just went back to why are there so many so many different ways so many different trails so they're measuring their feet and they don't really ever come to the conclusion i don't know how they ever could to say that well all of those footprints were ours they don't really say that there's there's human tracks and there's animal tracks back there too so it could be critters i'm not sure what type of critters would be in this area obviously there was something couldn't have been that dog because the dog was locked up in the house for three weeks according to official reports official theory i should say these shoes these sketchers i think these are david shoes i think these are david shoes from inside of the house from behind that recliner i could be wrong but i thought that was interesting that they took photos of them wearing the shoes and then in that one they had photos of them not wearing so now we can see all of these tracks tons of tracks there right um some human mostly human but somewhere in there there are animal tracks in there as well how deep is that snow for all of you snow lovers and all of you experts on snow, tell me how deep that snow is, you, you think. I, I'd be very curious about that. 
all right and this is that will lead down into the basement you can see a little dent there now we're getting into the windows we're still in the back right we're still in the back of the, of the house we can see those curtains we want to see those curtains one of the kitchen windows in the back was also unlocked it wasn't open but it was un unlocked everything else was locked except for two things in the kitchen the kitchen window and the rear slider everything else is locked except for those two so there you go so no need for forced entry you got two ways for people to get in right and we're now going to look at the east side of this house again you can see lines going from the top level into the basement at least two there and really not too much here on this side but only thing of value is uh, the fact that there's no windows on this side you can see maybe some animal tracks right there on the left side lower left side there but uh, other than that that's about it for that one now we're inside the house we're going to look at that back room one of the things we're going to notice about that back room is we did not get any photos of the back room when we first um, when we got the first 464 photos from the Apple Valley police look at all that dog poop you can see a lot of dog poop there I think this is one of the areas where the dog was kind of going poop this is misleading because that the basement door to the left looks closed it apparently in my view is it was not closed this door was open meaning the dog had access to it you just saw to the left you just saw dog food there there was dog food we just saw the image that we just saw right here is the only image where you might be able to see that there was a bullet in the living room ceiling but we're looking at the kitchen right now we're looking at this back room and uh, now we're going to the kitchen counter and you can see there's some milk bones on that counter you can see the coffee can you measure by the food by what you're seeing by the coffee by this can we measure uh, how long these bodies were there there's some money in there number 11 I'm not sure what that is but you can see some pills out there on the counter definitely had some there in that drawer and uh, this window is probably the kitchen window that was left open it's the only kitchen window so it must be and of course here we go the grease as well we've done a couple grease tests done a couple tests with these with this stuff and I think uh, we need to do some more tests on this how long was this pan sitting there how long were these things sitting there looking at the refrigerator we never got photos of inside of the refrigerator but i would have loved to have gotten some and i hope that in the future we can get some photos of to see what is inside of that refrigerator because we don't see any beer anywhere we see nothing like that university of minnesota school of public health here is that note that we see which i think is between david and kamel back and forth you know couples writing weird random letters <laughs> you'll see that you'll see that in a couple different places there's also a note behind there uh, these are tagged as number 46 and number 47 there are two separate tag numbers so you can get some of the tag numbers 46 and 47 confused here is what that note that was folded up said and there you go d i love you baby grug bug compare that handwriting make sure it's the same we're looking at the counter now you can see number 17 we got some blood there we're going to get into the oh it's a blurry picture we're going to get into this blood and we're going to see there's some hair on the floor as well but this blood and there's some other blood markings but this is the one that they really capture you can see all of the other ones obviously they can't couldn't get them all but number 17 is that blood marking there And there's number 20 this is underneath uh, the um, counter that kitchen island this is underneath that kitchen island this kitchen island that we're looking at here a lot of interesting stuff here and I don't know if there should be I'm not sure why the cell phone is there it's bloody but it's placed there there's some blood on that tissue box that we'll see as well and we'll see a lot of interesting things here that's number 26 clearly see that and that is clearly a finger from my view and but why is this here not only is this here look at this okay so you have a bloody phone that has a crack in it a couple cracks but the headphones don't look bloody nothing wrong with those headphones but it's all taken out of the pockets somebody said we got to take this out of our pockets 
empty your pockets, buddy. <laughs> That's the first thing that I thought of. Lighters, there's another lighter. You're gonna see lighters everywhere, lighters all over this house. Okay, that looks like, it looks cracked to me. It looks cracked. So I'm looking at the cell phone number 35 there. And look at all that blood on there. There's a lot of blood on that thing. But what's interesting is there's no blood on the um, on the headphones that were on top of it. Now we're looking at the other side. They've turned this over. This is David's cell phone. There's really no doubt for me on the island counter is David's cell phone. Here's another little iPad that we're going to see, number six. Um, all of these things, all of the electronics were taken in. They were gone through. They went through everything. And they found no reason why David would have committed these crimes. That needs to be clear. Here's his driver's license. I mean, everything is just right out there. It's, oh, hey, I just killed everybody. I'm just going to throw it, put everything out of my pockets. And yeah, it's just, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. Not following it. All right, there's some of the BCA documents there, which is kind of odd that they have all that there. And we're still looking at the counter. There's number 16. So you can see the trajectory of the blood, maybe. Are these, you know, is this a result from somebody being shot? Is this a result from somebody wiping blood off of their hands? It's definitely blood on that cell phone. Um, this kind of looks like that there was somebody shot there. So there we go. So now we're getting into the laptop. The laptop is one of the most important things that we're gonna see here. Look at that little Bluetooth little device there. Number 24. Uh, and number 25 has some blood on the side as well. It's very important to see that there's 25 without the label. And there's 25 with the label. And there's a lot here, right? What is going on here? Look at that. It's just, it's kind of just scattered around. It's just kind of, uh, it's just kind of there. It's kind of out there. But um, uh, be very curious to see what those test results were. Now the MacBook Pro was off. You can see the screen is off. Here we are, another in indention. But looking at the keys, judging by the keys, number 24, you can see exactly what was written, most likely in blood, what is covered in blood and what is not. So everything i have loved you all with all of my heart all of those keys should be bloody that white i think is more snow more related to some type of snow i could be wrong again but and there's blood all over there all over this keyboard there's blood even on the command key you see some blood there on the shift key and some blood on the lower side number 23 almost looks like a palm print there so you, you could in theory compare this palm print to what you see on the floor and see what is a palm and what is a foot but i'll leave that to you there's some hair as well a lot of hair a lot of hair that's mixed in with this you can get a closer view inside of that cup and now we're going through not only 23 and 24 but we got abc now none of this is going to show none of this is going to tie it to david so they can't prove that david wrote this that's the way that i interpret it because if they cannot tie this to David, how do they know David wrote this? They're claiming David wrote three things in three separate rooms. Okay, you can claim that, but can you prove it? And the answer is no. Did you try to prove it? Yes. And the results showed no. Why? Because they could not get a sample of David's palm. Well, then how do they know that David did it? here we go here's another it's not luminol that they sprayed here but they did spray something similar to it many people have pointed it out to me what this is and i hope somebody will leave it in the comments um i can go and look up i can go look that up too as well but uh, that's why i love our group members and our non-group members and all of our great people that are looking for the truth to find out what is going on here so they spray all this and still nothing Still no tie to David. Oh, how sad. Well, then how do you know that David did this, right? They're accusing. They can't prove, but they still keep accusing. If you accuse and you can't prove, the next step, the third step, should be to say he's innocent. Okay, there's one of the only pictures that we have that shows I have loved you all with all my heart. And now it's gone. All of a sudden it's gone, right? There it is. So once they start swabbing this, uh, they start taking it out. And there we can see a closer view of some of the playlist stuff. 
Now, obviously you can see some of these are not in order because you can see the screen is on and some it's off and some so there's the back you see that love there's a lot it's a key thing here is love and yet they're telling us there was no love they, he killed everybody that he loved whatever there's the dishwasher there's been some questions about that my only question is was it on was it off it's hard to believe that it was on for three weeks i i get it here's the kitchen um garbage now looking inside of the garbage here people have wondered about some presents where are the presents you can see at least one present from Rania to to her mom some eggnog in the back and uh, some hair dye as well possibly now here we have December 26 so this is the one that should be here now the date on which this was taken to the house is still in question because you have three different people telling you three different stories the guy who dropped off the paper says one day his mom says an, a second day and the, the person who is in charge of this paper going out gives us a third day so you can look more on that um, in my gray stage article that I did a, a long time ago but it definitely covers that and really makes my head scratch and the only thing left to do is to ask the coordinator what the heck was going on here so here is the dishwasher and we can see the dishwasher is open it was found open this is how it was found here number 22 this little blood another little blood speck what is this blood speck doing here all the lights are on on that dishwasher here's another close-up view so if the lights were on that makes me think that they were about to run this and something happened the scene was interrupted you can clearly see that by the fact that you see the dish soap there the dish soap thing is open so I don't know here's number 21 are these little spots where are these spots coming from how do these little spots get here but there's no other there's no other footprints or anything like that in any of the other areas it is strange I, I definitely agree with people who have brought that up it is strange where's all the footprints Where's all the fingerprints? Where is everything? But then you have one little spot, one little spot here and a little spot there. Okay. Okay, we're now looking at the photo leading into the living room. And here is that living room looking at it from the kitchen. And there is the blood writing on the wall. Very disturbing. You can even see a foot at the bottom of that photo there too. Just some of the tips of the feet. And you can also see on the couch, if you're looking at this image on the left side, there's bone wrapped in hair. We're getting here a closer view of the Allahu Akbar. A little blood there on the ceiling, possibly. Look at the time. That's very important. The books that are over there. There was a Quran found, so the question was, was that Quran part of this? Was it on that bookshelf there? And the question about the blood writing was it a live hand was it a dead hand was it a was it a gloved hand so those were some of the things going back and forth this gives us a really good view here of uh, what was written there's a very sad picture cool picture of all three of them together and a close-up of that one too this is on that bookshelf so i was wondering where the and of course uh, one of the only images of the bodies that you can see there and possibly the skull i think maybe the temporal bone um, i know there's it's been some back and forth on that but there's that skull there some of the quran pieces a lot of quran pieces torn out different areas and the question i guess would be was this purposely laid out like this right were these just random pages so uh, i never really got too deeply into the pages that we're seeing here but it's very interesting stuff. There is the live round that was found. That's an interesting one. How did the live round get there? And you can see some other flesh and hair, lots of hair everywhere, all different types of hair. There is the part of, of the teeth in the upper corner and a close up of that knife, which is open, which to me would also show a sign of a struggle, uh, maybe not forced entry, but a sign of a struggle was the hair cut. There's no indication where the where the uh, documents say that the hair was cut here's a knife how we first got it and i thought it was just camouflage but there was blood on that knife some of the the shell casings these are all submitted for testing and nothing is found on them so no tests were conclusive as far as i remember and there is the hand look at david's left hand uh the hand sign that it's making you can see the quran there closer up number four it's item four 
There's another one of item 9, which is another shell casing. And of course, some more um, hair and some flesh and just mixed in. Look at everything that is just mixed in. Uh, was that from the dog or was it something else? I'll let you decide that. Christmas tree. That blue tube in the back. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. So that gives us another indication there. There's number 30 with the, another shell. They're all tested. All of these shells are tested, but nothing's really found. Nothing of value, if I remember. Be good. It would be good to go back and look at that. But the living room is definitely the most important part because that's where the bodies were found. And the lack of blood, unless the blood is mixed in with that carpet there. And there's item 31, which is a fragment. Item 31 was one that they used to compare to item 57 later on. There's another shot of the skull uh, in the upper corner there. Here's the Quran. Open to this page, it was interesting. You can see a little bit of David's finger there. You can see how close the Quran was. Well, the other question is how close was the actual gun? So there is some bloody footprint, sorry, bloody fingerprints there mixed in with hair, pages ripped out. Was it ripped out here purposely? And why was it set here? If David did all this and set it there, it just set it there? Or was he, are they gonna tell us that he was holding the Quran while he shot himself? I, I highly doubt it. But you can see the lack of blood here, right? Uh, there are brain matter and all that type of stuff. There's number 37. Here's another shot. There's the decomp most likely, but could also be blood. But I'm gonna, you know, again, I'll let you decide whatever you want on that one you can see the little curve below the number four on the carpet there and uh, you can kind of make an outline of where the three bodies were at least of where david and kamel's bodies were maybe not ranya because she was kind of leaning up against kamel's left leg while kamel was face down facing number 44 in that area somewhere in that area you can see all the carpet all the blankets are now moved Looks like blood or decomp on that blue blanket in the left corner. The uh, laptop is also there and we get some more view, another view of that. You see all the different hair, different colors of hair at some point. Some of the shawl has been ripped right there. Could that have been from, from, from the dog? Uh, we can assume that, I guess. And here's another close up of that Surface Pro, Kamel Surface Pro that she was watching allegedly when she got shot and they put it up on the kitchen table to take a better shot. There's number 42. In the upper corner above number 42, uh, there was a question about if there was a bullet there too. So trying to see, because police did miss number 53, and that is the bullet that they will tie to Rania's blood. So how they miss that is one thing. And it rolls out of this carpet, unless there's another carpet that, we don't, that we're not seeing here, uh, number 53 rolls out of this carpet and is found two days later after the police are gone, after the bodies are taken out. So very disturbing stuff here. There's a closer shot of number 43. Now getting into 44. And it's just devastating. And you can see where the bullet is, where the bullet landed. Uh, very interesting stuff there. That's number 44. Some of the hair up there did kind of look cut. So be curious to see what's going on with that. What's going on with all the cut hair. And here's another shot. All the different angles, just trying to give you all the different angles to see this carpet. And I do believe a lot of that is just, that's why we're not seeing a lot of blood is because it's of uh, this carpet stained, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I don't know anything about this. I'm just guessing, could be wrong. There's number F. F is gonna lead into the bullet that we're gonna see that is lodged in the south basement wall. We're going to see that one later on. We'll definitely get there. Some more closer shots showing how it went through. Obviously, uh, police were able to look down and find this bullet, but for whatever reason, they could not look up and find item 57 until one month later when somebody tells them that item 57 exists. So here's part of the fragments of F, of item F, that will go down into the south wall of the basement, be lodged into the south wall there. So lots of holes here, holes on both sides of the carpet, obviously holes on both sides of this wood floor, and of course the hole into the, um, into the side of the, 
so F is a big one that goes down and then of course it's another good shot of F and we're also gonna see where Kamel's body is bagged now, that's not where her body was found it's just where it was bagged you can see on that uh, table the pyramid photo now there's a ring um, it's either I don't know if it's Kamel's ring or David's ring but there was a ring there on that table all of a sudden there you get a nice um, shot of those footprints or fingerprints whatever you think it is it's there and you can see the direction of the of the blood I think that's also key to see where that blood goes everything looks like it's leaning leading from the uh, living room carpet which is one reason why I do believe the bodies were killed here but again just a guess just a theory this is where they were found obviously we have to start there uh, measuring the dog poop looking at the dog poop and how old that poop could be will that help us get any indication of how long the bodies were actually here in the house I think that's a big one because you saw Kamel's foot there um, the sock was I guess was from the decomp not necessarily from any blood or anything but these are bloody footprints there there's number 13 where they're just kind of probably looking at the direction of how the blood is, where the blood goes uh, very disturbing stuff here I was disturbed going back to those prints there number 14 to me they look like footprints uh, the authorities call them footprints they're labeled as footprints but again you can judge for yourself what you think it is but that's number 14 there a different number 14 than uh, other 14s you might see because there's different item lists I think there's three three lists now that to me is number 15 is one of the more clear ones that looks like a like a foot like a right foot and more hair hair everywhere a lot, how far the hair went and where some of the blood was here's another interesting one where you just get some of the little blood splatter there or number 16 looking back on this floor here again you can kind of see where the blood is coming from and get some idea there and that could be because there's so much blood on that recliner maybe that's why we're not necessarily seeing a lot of blood in the area I don't know I mean I'm just trying to look at all this from all different ways here but definitely some of the later photos like I thought that they would do show more blood not everything is tested even that looks like maybe a little paw print or something there might have been a little paw print in that one because the dog was walking around next to number 18 to the to the right of number 18 and then here in the center of this photo here as well kind of looks like maybe a paw print but I don't know you would kind of expect more the dog was definitely here there's dog poop there so it was in this area uh, there's you know the, the the lack of blood I guess is what it goes back to um, there's number two obviously number two that's another interesting why is number two way over here so I'm <laughs> curious about that but okay that's another casing so they took they we got a lot of photos on this part here a lot of photos that show this some of those lines you know some of that lines underneath 18 I was thinking maybe that was from the dog or something too uh, you can see how far that hair went and why was there only one right foot only the right foot was bloody that would be that would be the uh, logical answer I would say yeah very disturbing very disturbing images here uh, for many reasons that one look, kind of looks like they're counter crossing number what is it number 14 and E kind of look like they're counter crossing so that's D and 15 and I think where E is I think that's the same foot so but man very wide steps David was about six feet tall maybe a little under six feet 
So, but they, it would have to be very wide steps. Just take one off the carpet and then one to the, uh, to take out everything from his pockets. Hmm. And then go back, I guess. And this is after these are sprayed here. And those, you can almost see the ones that were sprayed. I don't know. If, and there's the shoes in the background. This was before the marker was out. That's where item two is. There's number two, another shell casing with some hair there. Hair is everywhere. Hair and hair in the casings go hand in hand. Some more dog poop. You can see some is fresh, some is old. All different types. And uh, that one down at the bottom does not look very healthy at all. So again, this is just a collection of all of the photos that we have that we're going through. So you're seeing some of the same things. There's the three body bags, not where the bodies are found. Again, couch is pushed back. Now this recliner, item 34, makes you think somebody was shot at a low level, maybe on the ground, face down, I don't know, face up. But this whole area, this 34 area, that is not ever... It's not ever tested. It's just it just kind of gets lost in the shuffle. I don't know what they could have done. They could have ripped that out if they were able to rip out some of the south basement wall. Why couldn't they rip out a piece of this of this recliner and test it? And then how did the hair get way up there as well? And then you can see some of the blood splatter and how far it actually goes. How close would the bodies would any body had to have been, and from what angle, from from what height? This cage where the dog is. The dog could have been put in that cage. It was left out purposely. Maybe the dog at some point was in that cage. And you can see how far some of this stuff goes. Or that item, that number 32, and how far that goes out there. Right next to where the dog cage was. This, this stuff travels. It's going very, very far. How does it get way over here? It has to go past the Christmas tree past that recliner it's it's very interesting unless something was dragged here that was kind of my first view of how you could see in the uh, upper right corner where the yellow marker is kind of looks like something might have been dragged and they're they're going to find another casing there it's interesting the way that they label i guess they're labeling them from just walking from everything from the back door in number two i believe this is going to be number three yep number three there you can see uh, David's shoe that was a shoe that I was talking about to compare to the one that they had for his footprints in the snow nothing came of that so there's number 19 more blood and just spots right but what angle from what angle where is it going it looks it kind of looks like multiple right we got two different angles here it's a it's an interesting one right there 22 is kind of like was something dragged I was wondering was anything dragged here and if it was why did it kind of stop here or was this where the dog just kind of uh, walked right into it I'm, I'm not sure I don't know what this is that little um, the little water spot though I believe is from the authorities when they came in through the through the back door from from the snow on their feet just a guess I don't know or else that doesn't make any sense either because that definitely is not going to be there for th for three weeks but by this time they had marked everything so i think it was just from their shoes and there's 20 20 is an interesting one because it almost look, looks like a finger almost looks like a finger so i don't know maybe it was was somebody grabbing there i i'm not sure and on that vase you can see how far up it goes and uh, what is that 29 you see number 29 there is all of these drops they 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 tweak the camera that's why the the wall looked um looked very different there it looked pink almost so let's look at the front closet here not really a whole lot here you can see um there's a military jacket i kept this this way i did not tilt it like i could have because it did not look right it made the photo look kind of weird so just want to give you a view of everything that is in that front closet this is one of the more recent ones that that we got i did not have this and this closet was closed and again just just shoes really not much there nothing of no blood i think somebody said there might have been blood in that front closet on one of those um one of those jackets there there shouldn't have been 
unless somebody took it off or something. And here's more of the photos of that front door. Front door is another interesting one here because in some areas of where that doorknob is, right there, the doorknob itself doesn't look very new, but um, uh, that wood, it just, I don't know, it, it just kind of looks off. Something just looks off. It looks like something else was added on. Who knows? So when I mean adding on, just David was doing some minor upgrades, right? That's all I mean. Not that, not anything after the death, just what David was doing. He was the, the, the handyman of the house and doing this himself. So, so they're just looking for forced entry or lack thereof. You can see again, another little blood splatter that is all the way next to that light, which would explain why Sidra, um, I believe it was Sidra had spoken about some of the books that they got back had blood on them. And that would explain why, how far that blood traveled. Blood is probably would have had to have been on the Christmas tree. And of course, that's not where the gun was found, obviously. And you can see again how far it goes. It goes very, very far. And so it doesn't, I don't know, it's uh, from, from what angle, I guess, how far, how would David have had to have been sitting down, kneeling down? Here's another interesting one where you have the gun and you have the blood on the gun, on the trigger. David's blood was on that trigger. His blood, uh, there was a positive DNA of blood on that trigger that matched David's. However, it did not match uh, you know, they were not able to conclusively um, tie the magazine, the one in the, in the magazine to, to David, but they couldn't rule out Kamel and they couldn't rule out Rania. It's an interesting one. So there you can see the gun and the hairs. The hair is there too, especially where the hairs are. It just, it just looked like somebody like got pistol whipped. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just... I mean, the hairs that just doesn't naturally happen like that so at some point i think whoever had this gun they had to reload because you can see some of the markings there now they tested those but they could not get a conclusive match to david on those prints because they didn't have a match of the prints there were two bullets in there that were inside and then there was one in the chamber so I wanted to make that clear too, so everybody knows that. Two bullets inside of the magazine, one in the chamber. They could not conclusively tie this to David. They could put his blood on the trigger. I do want to make that clear. Let's move on to the hallway and the office bedroom. Here in the hallway, there you see how far that blood really travels. Those little splatters, they all travel. And I tried to give you a good view of the hallway all the way down, uh, photo by photo, kind of walking you down room by room. First, we're going to go into the office room to the right. Rania's room is straight ahead. David's room would be to the, to the, to the left, to the far left. And kind of in order down the hallway, here are the, are the photos that we have here. So some very interesting stuff that we're seeing. Uh, the thermostat set to 68. It's going to hold at 68. And there you go. There's your temperature. So here's a collage of some of the photos there. Kind of looks like this might have fallen down and was picked back up just, just by the way that the photos are in there. Unless it was purposely meant to be like that. I find that hard to believe. So I think at some point that fell down. And here there's the there's egg on your face and you got the photos there nicer view uh, Better shot there All the family. So I mean they had photos up of their family <laughs> Didn't seem like they didn't love their family or you know, it didn't have a big problem with their family Whatever it was it didn't there's no indication that it was something too serious just based on the little information that we have here so going down that hallway Next to the office room, right outside of it, is number 27, which is probably, it's definitely blood, right? You can tell that it's, that it's blood, but uh, from, a, from a finger, most likely, right? All right, now we're going to go into the office bedroom. And we're going to look at the couch. There's that couch there. Similar to the couch they have downstairs in the basement. 
there's what's going on there's what's in the garbage can so we can see all that and of course notes everywhere post-it notes lots of writings handwritings and there is Hera Act 1's and so I was curious to see what that is it's a I forget what it what it was some type of play or something but there's a password list right there got David's there got Camille's there the books they're gonna read lots of note post-it notes so uh, paper people <laughs> that's what I would have been looking for is paper and there it is look at that another paper towel there it's out and as you can see we'll get a closer view a better view of what's on that screen there we go there's a much better view right there it's definitely working definitely working I mean it was open this stuff was open it was on it was in motion is what it seems like <laughs> work was in motion there's love right there you can see that in the um, on the top kind of gonna go back I guess a little bit here and we're looking at some of the other photos this is from this is these are the BCA ones I believe but again try to put them in some kind of order they're not really in the best order here but you can see when the screen is off and then when it's on so you kind of get a get a view of that but I think the screen screen would have had to have been off in sleep mode there's a note you can look at the way that the chair is set all of the stuff missing on the bottom there's definitely dirt dust here is that note this is how they find it that pin they're going to be able to um, get one swab from that pin and that's about it so you can see Christmas is coming it will be a new year and that six looks like it was a five or maybe it just looks a little weird uh, what do we got here Kevlar helmet in aluminum foil so lots of notes lots of writings I'm assuming all related to the project that he's working on to the gray state project note where the chair is now the chair has been moved a little bit markers are up everything is being marked there's number 13 screen is back on that is on the um, that is on the table there too yep and there's some more of the passwords for 21 oh boy lots of them but there it, it's it's all on paper so <laughs> yet they have a note that they type out later okay there's 39 there's some more blood and none of this really um, I mean, none of it really goes back and directly ties to David. That's the biggest problem that they've had, and that's the problem that they're going to continue to have, unfortunately. There it is, Submit to Allah. Open the Rise, most recent version. Some blood there, and it's flipped open. It's flipped open on the back side, actually. That's, I thought that was interesting. So here's one side of it. And you can see the Sandy Hook, Fast and Furious, BHD, Graduation, some interesting stuff that the Titanic, Building 7, crossed off. That one was always an interesting one to me. And here, if you look at the lower level, it just looks like an area where something was wiped up or just not that much dust, whereas everywhere else is very dusty. So here are the terabytes, the hard drive, the terabytes of data that they got that they didn't find anything uh, showing them any motive of why David was guilty nothing there was nothing there but of all of these terabytes of data hmm, interesting yep they'll still just say that he's guilty and that'll be it We've got one of the family pictures and there's another one there nice hard drive got one of those Lots of hard drives, lots of backup hard drives. Everything's stored, kind of, I guess it's stored offline. There's an old school one, good for photos, things like that. Seagate. Yeah, everything back up. Everything is being backed up. GSC, Gray State, oh, Gray State C, Gray State B. So A, B, C, D. So a lot of these could have just been, um, you know, 
copy one, copy two, copy three, copy four, or maybe it was just you know part one, part A, part B, part C, et cetera, et cetera. There's GSA. Be curious to see if the same stuff on GSA is on GSB and GSC. A little blurry there. Number 18, BX. Number 19, HHP, Hothead Productions. 26, there's some of the chords. Oh, Lexar. Hmm. Missed that one before. All right, now we're looking at the wall here that's leading up to the closet inside of the office bedroom. I will always love you forever. Little Mexican thing forever. Registered nurse. It's Camel's files. Her documents in there. It's a working office. There's another maybe iPad, Surface Pro, something like that over there as well. Dear any American. Some checklists. All showing signs for the future. GS 2015 schedule. It's all there. Okay, there's the WGA, there is the Gray State. That's what it is for the writer. He's the writer of Gray State. Expire 6519. Oh, it's gonna expire this year. Interesting. Curious to see what happens then. Here's his unit. A couple photos of the unit there, and then we're getting into the to the closet. Gray State, the rise, more stuff. There's the camera. You can see the camera up there. More documents on the bottom. Can come out stuff. Second closet. <laughs> There's the Bohemian Grove Owl. I think we only got one shot of that. I get a little closer shot of the bottom of the owl there, but that's about it. The printer. The keys. That was another one. The keys right there. Maybe a title, car title right next to it. There you go. Somebody going to sell this car? It looks like it. More of the hard drives. Another backup. Lots of backup hard drives. But I think the keys on the table were some of the most interesting to me. Yep, another hard drive, another backup. GS Backup 03. Look at this, the rise. Oh, more stuff about the rise. I mean, definitely, <laughs> definitely doesn't seem like someone who's coming to an end. It's, it seems like just someone who's uh, just storing things, stacking things, having databases, having backups, backups for backups. And there you go, everything is backup. CT backup. The keys, a little closer view of the keys there. Another archive, 003. They're, they're labeled, everything is nicely labeled. So he knows what's on them. That would make sense. There's a Seagate. Another little hard drive there. Again, they have all of this stuff and nothing there. Now this one's interesting because it does look like maybe there could have been some blood on that. This hothead one, this is on the couch. I'm not sure where that number 35 came from. But there's more backups. There's a lot more stuff in there as well. More hard drives. Now the printer, number 36 here, that we're going to see it was, and there was another uh, lighter at the bottom of this desk too, but here is the contributor list. I believe this was, this was from the Democratic Party 2007 maybe, I always forget what year exactly, but David had that list in there and he also had, there's their marriage certificate, um, but yeah, it was curious that David had that list, and it was curious that that list was inside of the printer. It's not very likely people leave it in the printer. That's probably another hard drive there, number 37. And now we're looking at the wall. We're going to look at some of Kamel's accolades. But I think the fact that the that there was the printed up stuff inside of the printer still on the in the printer tray to me that also looked like a scene that was interrupted. That's just my view. And there's some more of the Kamel, the University of Minnesota, Master of Public Health. Very cool. 
Now we're going to look at the daughter's bathroom, the second bathroom inside of the house. Here are the two sinks. You can see one is used, the other is not used by the daughter, by Rania. And if she had to use like a step stool to maybe get up there, or I'm not exactly sure how tall she was, but there's a sponge next to it too, almost like it was going to be cleaned. The way that the sink is, I guess not this sink, but the other one that we're going to look at, but the way that this, the second sink is, uh, just is kind of odd to me, I guess, you know, you brush your teeth, but generally you would wash it out or even later, a couple days later. So it makes me wonder when was the last time that they brushed their teeth. There's the three photos and I've had some differing views on those three photos as well. They look kind of odd to me. I'll just leave it at that. You can see the toilet seat is open. Two towels there on the floor. Another thing to note, there is toilet paper there. But we're not going to see toilet paper inside of that toilet, as far as I know, close up of those towels. You can see that the toilet seat lid looks wiped. But is that toilet paper or is that more closer to uh, possibly towels, paper towels, or is it something else? It's not bread, it's not food. There's another cup, but there is no, there's the, the toys, but the curtain is not up. So another strange thing I would think would be taken into consideration. Now we're getting into the toys here. And of course, that's not how they were found. So you'll see multiple photos with toys next to the door and then other photos where the toy isn't next to the, to the door. So of course you had two entries. You had the Apple Valley Police Department and then you had the, the BCA team and the detectives, Apple Valley Police Department detectives too. More toys all over the ground. And doesn't this look like a scene interrupted? I mean, obviously it's a child's room. It could just be a regular child's room, but I would also uh, I would also look at signs of a not maybe not signs of a struggle, just signs of weird stuff, I guess. But you can see that the curtain is open. The child's room curtain is a little bit open there. Here's some of the photos. A lot of lots of photos of everybody, not just of David, not just of Kamel but all three of them, lots of photos of all three of them together. They're focusing on that bed. They're just taking photos of how they found that bed, seeing what's on this wall here into My Little Pony. Now we're getting closer to the, to the closet and no blood, nothing like that was found. Nothing of value pretty much from what they're telling us was, was found here in this. This is all just normal, uh, just a regular child's room and nothing suspicious no signs of intrusion no signs of a struggle nothing like that in this room there was another uh there was also another world map at the top that we kind of missed but there was a world map there as well in the upper left corner okay now looking at the master bedroom first thing you notice dog feces notice the socks on the floor that window was open a little bit now watch this bed Watch how things move around as they, uh, as the investigation continues. You can see the gun safe in there is open. But as it continues, you'll start to see things on the bed moving around here. Um, of course, you can see the dog feces there. You can see which rooms the dog feces was in and which rooms the dog feces was not in. There's the socks, there's a little notepad, a little piece of paper. Anybody could have written a suicide note right there if they wanted to, but guess didn't do that getting a close-up view here nicer view of the pin and the paper nothing on it nothing of value they don't mark it they don't um, take it in for evidence or anything so I'm assuming there's nothing of value on it now you can see the number 38 on the gun safe in the back there is a magazine a full magazine inside of that gun safe there you can see it looks like it's plugged in somewhere too as well see right above the Vicks vapor rub and you'll see some in some of these photos the uh, the vacuum is out and other photos of vacuum is in so we're going back and forth a little bit here looking and, and if you look at that bed looks like some of the bed sheet might have been cut a little bit on the right side so again one of the windows both of the windows look like they were 
and they were just open just a little bit at the bottom of the curtain of course right there they're not you'll see some of that stuff that is underneath that gun safe at one point some of that stuff will be on the floor it does look like a gun holster that is in there you can clearly see a marijuana pipe some wristbands there and this does open this safe does open two ways there's also a set of keys that we can see but the safe does open two ways it is by by the touch pad up top which is probably like a keypad i believe it is labeled as a keypad and uh, you can also open it through keys there is a place where you can insert a key as well and there you see it right there unless you got to do both i don't know <laughs> be good to find out there's that lamp, full mag inside, the mag looks black but it's actually silver and they'll give us some close up views there, it's number 44 and one of the evidence tags, it's from another angle, almost looks like there's something at the bottom, like an S at the bottom, it's interesting too, safe is number 38, the safe is taken as evidence. Whereas number 34, the recliner, at least part of the recliner, is not taken. Of course, big difference in the size, but still, some things are taken, some things aren't. There's no blood on that gun safe either. It's just touch DNA, and it only matches Camille. Another close-up view. It definitely looks like a 5 at the bottom in that view. And here you can see that um, this is loaded. There are 11 rounds in this one. That was made clear. At first I thought this was tied to the murder weapon, but it's not. This is the second one. This is the one that's found in the gun safe. Has hollow points as well. Now we're looking up. You can see above the lamp there, some little markings. David's pants on the ground, other stuff on the ground, a blanket on the ground come out so it was always a question of what side is this was this David's side or Kamel's side also looks like there's a there's a knife another knife right there I, I'm not sure if that's a knife it's hard to tell it's something though the watch sharpie some books all this stuff just right here so I'm not sure if this was a side that David slept on or the side that Kamel slept on hard to tell There's the holster on the ground. Somebody brought up that the jeans look kind of wet. So let me know if you see that. If you look at those jeans in the past photos, if they look wet to you. I'd love to hear your guys' view on that. And now you can see the vacuum is back inside. Of course, the, va the vacuum was inside of the closet at first. And then in later photos, the vacuum was pulled out. And I'm assuming that's when they went behind the vacuum. There's another large trunk case. Never did find out what was in that trunk case, but it'd be good to know. Some of Kamel's purses, some of her items, more of her items. Does this look like a scene that was interrupted as well? Any signs of a struggle, anything like that? Looking at more, I see the wire going up next to where the books are. I was curious what that is, just a set of lights or something else. The attic is right above this area as well probably connected to those lights up top is where that power plug is going in let me know if you notice anything on that bookshelf as well some interesting books over there i'm sure and there is the entryway into the attic that they won't find until much later what else do you see here what do you see of value here? I'm not seeing too much, but still curious. And of course, weed out on the table. Kids around, but just gonna leave the weed out on the table like that. The weed out on the table, the way that it is, looks to me generally like a scene that was interrupted. Somebody got interrupted doing something. Nobody just, you know, puts this stuff out there and then decides to go kill their kid. Uh, you can see right now the credit cards are not out there in the image before they were so they're put they're pulled out there and then they're all photographed but right now this is what, it, what you're looking at right now is how it, it was found and that's probably Kamel's cell phone 
and there's the weed just laying out there in transit about to be used the weed was closed be good to know if we could tell how old this weed was how long it might have been sitting there I think that would be a good a good thing number 42 Camel's cell phone and you did see the, those uh, credit cards and the debit cards that were out there but those were not out there like that they were put out there by the police and photographed you see the window open the curtain open a little bit now we're gonna make our way into the bathroom here a few key things that we noticed inside of that bathroom that were interesting as well obviously the sink I first thought that that was blood in the sink Police don't indicate that it is. I don't know what it is. Bong water, whatever it is. It's something. Paper towels again on the ground. Paper towels in every room. Now this one doesn't have any toilet paper. No toilet paper in this sink. But you can see what is this? What are we looking at here? If it's not blood, I'd love to know what it is. Is it more darker? These better photos kind of look a little more dark. It still looks reddish to me, so I don't know. There's the bong there in the corner. And a nice little note there. another cup we're gonna see cups next to every toilet for some reason there will be cups but I just found it a little strange in this one that there's no toilet paper when this should have been the one that I would expect it to have toilet paper first but apparently not it's lighter on the ground probably I could have been used to light the bong I'm sure the towel so now they open it up you can clearly see that it's been wiped the top of this the seat has been wiped there's a toothbrush there probably used to clean that bong water as well some of the Camel stuff so definitely a shared bathroom and the curtain so this one does have the curtain at least curtain is attached and again just looking inside they don't find anything of value nothing no blood nothing like that no signs of a struggle We're now looking at the Crowley garage. We're gonna see the two cars in there. Uh, the black car was the one that Sidra dropped off in October, and the gray one is one that was that Mr. Alon bought for David. Here's David's little tool shed area. You can see all the nice tools there. Uh, some interesting stuff on that wall. There might have been a camera mounted on that wall has been one of the theories. Haven't really found too much to it, but Here's another close-up view of that desk there. And uh, you'll see in the back, there was a, there's a Gray State photograph or Gray State poster that shows the prices and stuff of uh, the t-shirts, stickers, etc. 20 bucks, something. There is another chest there, another uh, black box there. And we're just getting a nice view of the whole car here as well. This black car, again, was the one that was brought in, uh, brought by Sidra. Sidra picked up a different car and left this black one there. So this one was there since October of 2014. And they got the plates on there. And the other car, the gray one, from what I was told, uh, was the one that um, Mr. Alon bought for David. We're getting some more shots of the tools. Everything that's on the walls there, two bikes, two helmets in the back, all the tools, show snuggling tools, everything like that. Here's the other side of the garage. There's an American flag. There's that garage door. You get to see the other side of the garage door there. And how nice and neat some of the stuff on those shelves are as well. Another Gray State poster. Ron Paul sticker. You can also see those targets in the back. Some of the same targets. And you can get a general view of where the garage was and the distance into the house. There's some of those targets again. Uh, some of the same ones were left outside of the house. RFID clinic. Interesting there. Now we're looking more, a little closer at the gray car both Toyotas look like one might have been up for purchase they might have been wanting to sell one of these cars Let's see about that there were uh, theories that they have planned to move to California so they wouldn't need two cars so 
even more reason to think that they might have been wanting to sell one of them, if that's true. <clears throat> now we're going to look inside of that gray car. Again, this is the uh, major car here and lots of survival things in there. Um, some might say that this is a get out of Dodge packet. You never know. But it's very important to note that it was found in this trunk and nothing is mentioned about the other trunk. But you gotta have some ammo. He's got the gun there, so if he needed to take his gun with him, boom, throw it in there. It's all legal, it's all right. Maybe not in California. <laughs> so, good shots, good close up shots of all this stuff here. That makes you think um, that they were planning on leaving tickets. You can look at the date of the tickets when they're valid, too. This is one of the item number 46s and 47. There are three, I believe, three or four different item lists, so. A close up of those bullets. You can see the shape that they're in. And we're going to look at those shelves that we were talking about. There's a bullet exchange photo in the back, some tiki lights for outside, probably in the backyard. And just yeah, another good shot there. I think we're going to start closing up on that door, getting a nice close up view of that door there. Definitely some barbecue gear, some paint rollers. And they close up on that door just to make sure no signs of force entry or anything. So when they're talking about no signs of force entry, that's one of the things that they're talking about. And there it is. There is the guillotine shot. And now we have come to the basement. Now we're going to start looking inside of the basement. You see here the door is closed. In the next shot we're going to see the door is open. I do believe the door was open that it was found like this. And now we're going to get try to give you all of the different shots that we have of those stairs going down in some type of order uh, so you can see all these first shots that we're going to see here should have the stairs in them at some angle at some point we're looking down now and the hair that I thought that was kind of weird that some hair was just kind of randomly there looking for any signs of blood anything like that if a hand or something like that was dragged down here no signs of that but definitely a little piece of hair that we're going to see no flesh or anything that's found but the hair is very interesting and then the the poop that's found that hair it looks like it's consistent with the hair and stuff that was found upstairs a couple of shots of that um, of the dog feces here good close-ups there still looking at the stairs trying to give you guys a view of a th almost like a 360 of what it would look like if you were to um, look at, at the stairs because when we first got some of the photos it was still hard to figure out where the stairs were of course now we have the actual diagram so if you guys need those we we definitely got those for you you can see the dog poop on the ground you're going to see that everywhere it's all over this area um, it, when they say all over it's not like it's piled on top of each other or anything it's just you see some here some there some there and it's everywhere if you really look at all these shots if you were to calculate them you'd see a a lot of these shots do have some type of dog feces in them. I thought the Spider-Man was interesting because there was one one of Kamel's friends that said David was um, going to be a part of the next Spider-Man movie. I was trying to find the timeline, figure out what Spider-Man movie they were talking about. Maybe there's some truth to that. I don't know. All right, and uh, still looking at this, you can see this is when the police come down here. Obviously, they're like, what is this? They're going to see some guns, some, some other... Um, some other weapons some military stuff you know props things like that whatever it is but definitely would raise their eyebrows to see if this guy is stocking up for like World War three or something like that <clears throat> of course we know that's not true or anything but still I mean they don't know they don't know what's going on at, at this point so more stuff of the uh, table there this is all still in that open area on the bottom um, there you go there's some ammo and some interesting stuff here but this is all kind of in that in that in that open area still we're still there looking behind where that black couch is that black couch also behind that black couch we're going to see what might be some decomp that leaked through the through the living room floor we're going to see that here closely close up <coughs> and these weapons more shots of the weapons of course Yeah, 
yeah, I mean, props, whatever, dummies, um, paintball stuff, whatever it is, uh, to the cops, it must have looked kind of strange. It must have looked strange to them to see all this stuff here. But it wouldn't take them long to figure out that this was a soldier, right? And why is all this stuff here? Were they packing up? Were they getting ready? I mean, was this part of their, their move? It's, you know, there's movies on the ground you can see over there too as well. So, I don't know what that pipe is. Oh, like a bong pipe. Oh, I didn't notice that before on that black case there. It's always something that I don't notice. Why so I keep going over these and making sure everybody has them because another set of eyes might see something that, that I miss. So, with the drum set, you can see how old that drum set was, how new it was. You can see David's U.S. military bag there on the ground. Uh, we can see the Don't Trend on Me. That's a big one. I believe the flag was a Pakistani flag. I believe that was... Uh, took a little while to figure that out, but a quick search, and someone was able to quickly figure that out. The head there, the white head, I think that is part of... Uh, there's a scene in the trailer that shows this guy's head turning white with blood, and I think that was used for that prop. Muse, I don't really know that much about them, so you guys probably do. I don't know. I'm not really into that, but uh, Patriots Rise, getting another close up of the Gray State photo here. Where those pillows were is where one of the windows are. You can see the uh, one of the boards on the ceiling is now out. David's equipment, all of his music gear all right down here still in this open area some more posters some more shots of that it's a close-up of that all these photos nice FEMA shot there <laughs> the Dark Knight Batman definitely I was a fan of that. And here is some of the decomp stuff that we're going to see in the back on that wall. You'll be you'll start to see what I first thought was blood. I don't know what it is, but definitely it's if it's not blood, it's decomp, a mixture of both, etc. It's something, but I uh, question maybe it was some type of leak or something. That could be too, I guess, but I just found it kind of odd that this is also in the same area where the bullet will crack will go into the south wall so this is all on the south wall here is where it's all going to be and now we're going to get into that bullet shot this is f from the living room so this is the bullet that goes down shoots into the uh into the south wall and is lodged there getting some good close-up shots of that Hey, this bullet travels it's a it travels pretty far it goes through wood that's i believe that's real wood it goes all the way down through this through the paneling and lodges into that south wall so interesting and of course nothing ever comes of that bullet there's no blood there's nothing tied to it they don't they can't even they don't even have lead that's tied to it so that, that was kind of odd but when they cut it out, you can see that's at this point, they've cut it out to kind of uh, preserve it as best as they can. They've taken out some of those boards on the top. This will give us a better view, a better, better angle of where that bullet went, what, where it came from. Because it's a very important one. Um, this is a missed shot, whatever it is, whoever did it, somebody missed. They shot at the ground and missed. I don't know, that's the way I took it. So that's the other side of F that we're seeing there. This is what it looks like. We saw this in the living room when the carpet was pulled back. Now we're getting a shot of it from what it looks like on the on the basement and where it's lodged there. I think is also interesting. You can get a very good shot there of how big that bullet hole is. And going down, now it's a little wet. If you look at where F is in that last shot when it was labeled, it looked a little wet. A little different there's another shot there some of that uh, some of that side wall goes right into this lens right on top of here that was interesting too that 
drywall it just lands right in the drywall there getting a, getting some other shots and they're just kind of and and again these are these are from two or three different sets of photos maybe from a combination of three or four different cameras so that's why it looks kind of different but here it looks a little wet if you look at f the way it is it looks a little wet to me and you don't see the bullet there and that's just that just shows kind of how deep it went in wow look at that that's really deep and that's where it's lodged so they cut that out uh, this is F this is number 45 item number 45 bullet number 45 and if you look up number 45 there's really there's they don't find anything they can't rule anybody out but that just means they don't have any any way to tie it to, to any of the of David Kamel or Rania either and they're clear to note that all the documents note that as well all right you can see a lot of dog feces there now we're going to go into the bathroom we're going to start to head our make our way into that bathroom it's very easy first looking at the photos to get kind of confused of where the layout what the whole layout of this house is unless you've been there unless you've seen it now we're moving into this bathroom this looks like a built-in bathroom this uh, maybe David built this himself. It looks like he was building. There's there's a couple rooms back here. It's actually pretty pretty nice. You can see that tubing. That's still a question that that I have. Also, the sink is plugged. Um, definitely good to look inside of that toilet. Even that we're looking at the sink here. Really nothing there. Not seeing anything about anything similar to what we've seen in the sink in the master bedroom. This looks just like a sink that hasn't been clean this looks like like a man sink <laughs> this is like a man cave this is all part of it this these red uh, these circle things are actually in insulation so i think uh, i don't know if that was because of the whole music thing that he was working on but you can definitely tell that here unless there's you know more to it there but it's just seemed like david was a was a builder he was building these things he had, uses two different types some of the some are the blocks right under that toilet paper you notice toilet paper toilet paper is pretty full too and there's a cup next to that toilet we're going to get a, another close-up shot of that toilet because this is a very important one to measure that water see how low that water is and it's clean no indication of any dog or anything accessing that water but the dog would have had access to it and there's the towel the bleach towel right there and now we're going to get another shot of the towel and then we're going to make our way out of this bathroom i think that's all that's about all the photos they have of that bathroom you see that photo there going back down this hall and we're going to make our way back into the back uh to where the washer and dryer are and we see some more dog feces on our way there's two more rooms back here to the left and I believe to the right and there's that door that door is just kind of just randomly there on the ground there's a pantry to the right of this photo I believe to the left is where the washer and dryer are you can see some Christmas present wrapping paper there you can see another dog carrying case some more luggage uh, some interesting stuff there there's actually things in the in the dryer is what it looks like so again uh, not too many people kill themselves they leave the they leave all of this out and then kill themselves I, it's hard to believe but just getting some more shots of that sink too and here's the back area where the heater is some more of the military gear probably for props things like that just storage a lot of storage space here some of that Morton looks like was that cement oh salt right the salt probably to salt down the um, the garage the driveway sorry all right now we're going into that pantry see some water there you see a lot of uh, this is good everybody should have stuff like this you really need this because you just never know it's always good to have something major happens you can't get to the grocery store you can't get to water etc etc everybody should have something like this if you have a room if you have space so they definitely did some of that e-food stuff I've looked into some of that storable foods what it looks like breakfast rations 
pretty well stocked up. Some sausage and tomato sauce. All right. Water treatment, water filter stuff. So they definitely, uh, definitely know a lot about um, the bad water that we have, <laughs> the bad air, the bad everything. Tons of water there, so they got their own water. But they are ready. They are stored. They are stacked. They are ready. If they needed to, um, if they were not able to get to the grocery store or not able to get to food, water, they were ready. I think that's the most important there. And I want to thank everybody for watching this. For looking at this I hope this helps I hope the uh, I hope looking at all of this helped you guys because we, we got a long way to go here and a short time to get there let's go we are now going to look at item 53 this is the bullet that was found on January 20th 2015 I'll show you the photos first there's only one two three four five six photos and then we'll discuss it so let's go through these six photos here this is pulled up against the blood wall. So where that couch was, the couch has now been moved and this desk is pushed up against that same wall. You can see to the far left, you can even see that uh, the white painting of that wall. Because when the cleaners came in, they painted this wall white to cover up that blood painting, the blood smearing, all that stuff. So, so when the cleaners came in, they painted this, got rid of the Allah U Akbar written in blood, but this is that same wall. This is the west wall. You can barely see that mushroom bullet right there in the center on the floor. This rolled out of a carpet. I'm assuming the living room carpet. We'll get to that. Here is a comparison to a pin. Shows you exactly where it is. Let's go to the next one taking measurements here doesn't appear to be any blood or anything but apparently blood was found on that and the blood matched Rania the five-year-old daughter so on January 18th they leave the house without this bullet here's another shot of the bullet reading from Brian Bones report here at approximately 1300 hours on 120 2015 detective McKnight was contacted by the company cleaning up the Crowley residence at the request of David's father the cleanup crew personnel notified detective McKnight that they had discovered a bullet at the residence they relayed to detective McKnight that while picking up the rug from the main living room area a bullet had come out of the carpet and fallen to the floor they were uncertain exactly where the bullet had been on the carpet but said that it had fallen out of the rug and onto the adjacent hardwood floor. I responded back to the scene where I assisted in collecting the bullet that was discovered. I photographed the area, finding that the crime scene cleanup crew had cleaned up the residence. So they're not exactly sure where the bullet was, but it was attached to that carpet. And somehow the investigative, the crime scene team, the BCA, they missed this collecting evidence everybody collecting evidence misses the bullet will be transferred to the bca crime lab for further analysis it should be noted that the bullet was predominantly flat on the back and was sitting on the front mushroom portion of the bullet the bullet appeared to be mostly intact at the time of our discovering it the photographs of the bullet were later downloaded to a secure server at the apple valley police department so that's what brian bone says about item 53. here's what detective mcknight says about item 53 since these meetings i've worked with the family on a number of issues including getting the dog that was found in the house to dj they also asked that i work with the biotech crime scene team and escort them into the house i was contacted by the cleanup team while they were in process they stated that they had located a bullet that had been rolled up in the carpet the bullet had rolled out under the hardwood floor that had already been cleaned I went to the house and assisted Detective Bone and Booth in collecting the bullet. Here's another interesting thing about item 53 is when the blood tests are done, when the DNA tests are done, it is found that there is a mixture of two or more people. David and Kamel are excluded from being contributors. So we have another person here, another person that contributed to item 53. Very curious 
Very curious there, right? Perhaps this might be the biggest smoking gun of them all. Does this show that somebody else was in the house? Does this show that somebody else was in the house at the time of the murders, at the time of these killings? How does item 53 match Rania, but not David or Kamel? It's an interesting one there. There's also mentioned in the BCA report that item 53 was shot from item one. So if they believe that item one shot item 53, yet item 53 is showing two people's DNA and David and Kamel are excluded, could that mean that somebody else fired item 53 from item one? Whatever the case, it is two or more DNA profiles that were found on item 53. One matches Rania. It does not match David and Kamel. Let's now look at item 57. Item 57 is also a bullet that was found on February 18th, 2015. No blood is found on this bullet, but the DNA profile does match David Crowley. In all of the photos that we have, there is one that shows the ceiling where the bullet should have been on January 17th. Let's look at that one. And here is the only image that we have so far that would show whether or not a bullet hole was in the living room ceiling when the police first entered this house on January 17th, when these photos were first taken. This photo is included so that way you can see what it looked like one month later, what the house looked like there. In the second image, we're pulling back a little bit. You can see that the marker on the south wall is still there. I'm not sure if blood is still there or not. Let's look at the third image here. Getting another shot. And you can see definitely uh, some things look white there. Two different types of curtains, both red, not matching at all. The shoes are still there on the ground. Let's look at the next one. Now we're getting a closer image. So hard for me to say exactly if that's before or after Joe Cooksley puts his finger through this hole. So the reason that this hole might look a little big to us right now is because by this point, Joe Cooksley has already put his finger through it. All right, here's another angle of that hole that you can see there. They don't mention any traces of blood or anything like that here, so. Let's go to the next one, an even closer image. This is gonna lead up into the attic. Let's go to the next one. Now we're pulling back a little bit so we can see uh, where somebody would have to be standing or sitting, kneeling, etc., for the bullet to enter in this way. Let's go to the next one. It's gonna give us a little more close up view here. It's a pretty big hole. Obviously you're not gonna miss that one right there. So I'm assuming that is when Definitely after Joe Cooksley put his finger through it for whatever reason. Here's another image going, scrolling to the next one. We get to see that hole in the distance from the light for one last time. That'll be the last one at this distance. Let's go to the next one with the marker there and you can see. Now, if the marker is up, I would hope that this was taken before Joe Cooksley put his finger through this hole. Hard to really tell. It would be good to, uh, it would be good to follow up on that for sure. Here's from another angle, same one. You can see the distance. It's a, it's a big hole at this point. Now we're going into the attic. This is from the master bedroom. You can also get to the same attic from the garage. And I believe one person went up this way and the other BCA crime scene team person went through the garage and they scattered the attic, they looked through the attic. What you'll notice here though, in the next photo right here, is that there is a ladder there. And this ladder was not there when police left this house on the 17th. Not clear if it was there when the police left the house on January 20th or not. But that's how they got up there, or that's how somebody got up there. So somebody was up there, and we know that that was Chris Klein, Mason Hendricks, and that cast of characters, a group of them. 
depending on who you ask, you might get different um, stories about who exactly was in the house on January 19th. We'll get to that later. And here's another shot to show the distance, how far back it was. Let's go to the next one. We're now in the attic. Okay, so hard to see there where it is, but it's kind of in the upper left corner is where the bullet is. Let's go to the next photo. Getting another angle so you can see the drywall. The bullet goes up through this attic. Skip to the next one. Hits this top paneling here. You can see by the white marks there. Let's go to the next one. And lands right here. You can see exactly where the bullet lands. Next shot is a little close up view, closer view of that one. Let's go to the next one here. It's a close up view of that hole. Let's go to the next one. Close up view of the plywood leading to the roof. Next one. It is now labeled as item 57. Next shot, a closer view of item 57 as well. Next one gives us item 57 still, but now we're pulling back a little bit so we can see exactly where the bullet went into the attic and then bounced back down. So hopefully that will help somebody give us some clear indication of where the bullet was coming from here. Here's an even further view, a little pulled back a little bit more. These are all DSC, by the way. Next one. Now some of these were included in the BCA photos that we got later on, unlike item 53. And let's go to the last image here and you can see where the white markings are and where the bullet probably ricocheted. But in, in order for it to ricochet here, to land back down where item 57 is found, how far away would someone have to be? Would someone have to be literally on the ground? And none of that answers the question of why police miss this either. So let's read from the police reports. This is Brian Bones' police report about Chris Klein. This is where it gets very interesting. Okay, on 217, I spoke to Christopher Klein, who identified himself as a friend of the Crowley family. I had been trying to locate Klein to learn why he had been at the Crowley residence on 119 as a neighbor had called in about a suspicious person at the house. Klein received my business card at his residence and called me back at approximately 1700 hours on 21715. Klein wanted to ask me questions about the status of the investigation and was speculating about how many rounds had been discharged at the house. He indicated to me that he had been in the house since the discovery of the Crowley family at the residence. He said he had been there with David's father and brother and had seen there were two shot rounds in the floor and roof. Prior to this conversation, I was unaware of a round being shot into the ceiling roof. Detective McKnight assisted me in contacting David's father and to ask for permission, consent, to enter the home to look for the damage to the ceiling. On 2-18-2015, Detective McKnight spoke to Daniel Crowley and obtained permission to go into the house. At approximately 1,500 hours, Detective McKnight and I used the house key in the front door lockbox to gain entry into the house. We immediately found what appeared to be a bullet hole in the ceiling near the front door and adjacent to the living room. From my initial looking at the hole in the ceiling, it appeared that the bullet may have come from the living room area. Based on the angle, the bullet appeared to have traveled through the sheetrock. We looked for access to the attic area of the house and found that the attic access from the master bedroom room closet was open. This had not been open at the time of our initial search of the house on 117.15. I contacted the BCA crime scene team and advised them of our findings. I requested they assist us in documenting the damage and assist in looking for the bullet in the ceiling and attic area. We secured the house and Detective McKnight maintained security on the house while I obtained a warrant for the house. I prepared a search warrant for the house to recover the bullet believed to be in the ceiling or attic area. 
On 218.15 at 16.25 hours, the Honorable Judge S. Moynihan signed a search warrant granting us access to the house to recover what was believed to be a bullet from the ceiling. Detective McKnight and Tietz assisted me in executing the warrant with the assistance of the BCA crime scene team and Special Agent Olson with the BCA. During the warrant, they found what is believed to be a bullet in the attic area of the house. See the BCA crime scene team's report and photos for more information on the bullet. The BCA crime scene team collected the bullet and completed a proper receipt, a property receipt, which was left at the house. Here's where it gets interesting. On 219.14, I viewed photos taken from the initial search of the house. In viewing these photos, I could see the hole in the ceiling, which we discovered on 218.15. So he's claiming the photos do exist. This is still Brian Bone. The photos do exist that show a bullet hole was in the living room ceiling on January 17th. But he also states here that he did not see it. He was not aware that a bullet hole existed on January 17th. Nobody was. Nobody, nobody was. Uh, Detective Gummert was a little more evasive in his answer about that. He said that he did see the bullet hole, but he wasn't sure when. And I think what it comes down to is nobody saw it on January 17th and nobody knew about this bullet until February 18th a month later Wow detective McKnight writes something similar he says on 218 2015 I was informed by detective bone that there may be a bullet hole in the living room ceiling at the home of David and Kamel Crowley the party given detective bone the information was Christopher Klein Klein reported to be a friend of the family and had said he had been inside the home with Dan Sr. and Jr. and had seen the bullet hole then. During the initial processing of the crime scene, we knew that we could not account for several bullets that may have been fired from the gun used. The information given to Detective Bone could not be verified since we could not establish a definite connection between the reporter and the family. I contacted Daniel Crowley, Daniel Sr., I contacted Daniel Theodore Crowley, the father of David Crowley. To our knowledge, he is the next of kin in this case. He told me that he was not aware of the bullet hole and had not gone into the home with Klein. I asked for permission from Dan Sr. to enter the home to verify that there is a bullet hole. He agreed to let us in and provided us with the lockbox code. Detective Bone and I went to the home and found the bullet hole near the entryway in close proximity to where the Christmas tree had been. We exited the home and ensured it was secure. I waited in the driveway until Detective Bone could obtain a search warrant. He obtained a search warrant authorized by the Honorable Judge Moynihan. He also contacted the BCA crime scene team to search for the bullet and document the scene. The bullet was located in the attic rafters under the insulation. The measurements and collection of the bullet was completed by the crime scene team. I stayed at the house the entire time and assisted the crime scene team in locating and documenting the location of the bullet. I was assisted by Detective Tietz. The search started at 1700 hours and was concluded at about 1935 hours. The bullet was taken by the BCA for further examination. And once this bullet is tested, once item 57 is tested, it comes back with one male DNA profile, matches David, does not match Kamel, does not match Rania. The results show that blood was not detected on item 57. So the DNA profile does match David. There's no blood on this bullet. Very curious.
All right, so here is the big 485 page PDF. Now, it can be a little bit overwhelming when you download a PDF and you see that it's 485 pages. I get it, but it's worth it. It is worth going through. And I'm gonna try to give you a little teaser here of why you should go through this, I guess. The first reason, obviously, is for facts or is for data. So if you don't believe what is being written in this report is necessarily facts, it is data. So we are collecting data. The first thing you're gonna find from page one through five is the Minnesota BCA ACISS 2015-28. Report is dated 1-17-2015. You have the occurrence dates of 1-17-2015 at 1400 to 118 2015 at 5 30 a.m. 0530. Page 6 through 8 is Brian Bone's application for a search warrant January 17th at 1506 military time. That would be 3 p.m. Page 9 and 10 is the actual search warrant that is signed by the judge of the district court at 1506. Page 11 is Brian Bones' receipt, inventory, and return. This shows that at 1651, they searched the house, the vehicles, and the bodies. They collected items AV-1 through AV-22. Pages 12 through pages 13 are written by Sean McKnight. The receipt, inventory, and return. Date of search warrants issued by the judge is the wrong year on both pages, 12 and 13. The collected items AV-23 through AV-55 were collected or at least uh, written down by Sean McKnight. And you can see on this, you can see that it's noted who actually um, collected that item. You'll see a TB, Tara Becker, SM, Sean McKnight, and so forth bb brian bone so that's what those um little indications are next to it page 14 through 17 is the minnesota bca aciss investigative supplement report 2015-28-1 report date is 1 2015 two case files are mentioned here the avpd 15-303 and the other case file that is mentioned here is the MNBCA Forensic Laboratory S15-00662. Okay, so 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, and 1.3 are CDs. There are three CDs out there. 1.1 contains the raw digital images of latent prints from the crime scene. 1.2 is a CD that contains raw digital images of handwriting on wall from the crime scene. And 1.3 is a CD containing raw digital images of bloody footprints found at the scene. Page 17 specifically mentions blood footprints. Now, I know that there is an image out there, a couple of them out there, that when I first saw the pictures of uh, blood, bloody prints on the kitchen living room area floor, I thought they were handprints. I really did. I go back and forth some sometimes, but I do, right now at least, I do believe, yes, they are foot, they are footprints. So I've been looking of any evidence of them being either footprints or any mention of them being fingerprints. But here they are specifically mentioned on page 17 as footprints. So we're gonna start there, okay? We're gonna say, okay, this is what the BCA, this is what the investigators concluded at this point that they were footprints. What's even more interesting is that you can clearly see that it is one foot, it is a right foot. So here's what I have some notes for about page 18 and 19. This is a laboratory analysis request at the attention of Tommy Booth. The estimated due date for these latent prints would be 426, 2015. The estimated due date for the question documents, which we'll cover later, would be 4-26-2015. So they're saying by 4-26-2015, they should have some answers about the latent prints 
and about the question documents. The circumstances and purpose of the analysis is for the latent print comparison and the handwriting analysis comparison. Sticking with that document on page 19, the document was submitted by Elizabeth Elliers of the BCA and received by Carol David on January 26, 2015 at 11, 17, 48. Page 20 is interesting because it's, it's a draft page. There's, draft is written three times in red on this page and there's really not much to this. This was filled out and this is, okay, so we're getting into the ACISS report. Now remember, ACISS report 2015-28. And what you're gonna see is a lot of these documents are gonna have the same name ACISS report 2015-28, but then it's going to have a slash two, slash three. Let's go to page 21. MNBCA ACISS attachment 2015-28 slash three. The report date is 126. This is the preliminary autopsy. Okay, so page 23, 24, and 25 are the press release report about this case regarding David Kamel and Rania, released by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. And it basically says David died as a result of a suicide. Kamel died as a result of a homicide. Rania died as a result of a homicide. By 121, there's no doubt in their mind. Or they wouldn't have released those documents. But they needed to, especially for public panic and really, really, especially just for all of the conspiracies. But I didn't think that they really gave the conspiracies any, any chance. They did not even want to consider a conspiracy here. That's the way I saw it. I don't see any. I mean, you can look at, you can read these police reports and you can clearly see they're very careful to mention the public is not in danger. Everything is fine. We got this case solved. That's pretty much all we were getting. And that just fueled so many conspiracies. And instead of helping these conspiracy theorists kind of understand what was really happening, a lot of people just went silent. They went dark. And I can understand, you know, it's the, it really puts the investigators in a very tough spot, especially if they really do want to help the public understand what happened here. It's a very tough spot now because it is an ongoing investigation. But at the same time, they're completely discrediting any possible theory of foul play. They're completely glossing over any possible explanation, any reason, anything that might show that they cannot prove David Crowley is guilty. It's one thing to accuse him but it's another thing to actually prove it. They were successful in accusing him to a point and up to a certain, um, up to a certain date is what I think. They were very successful in trying to convince the public and trying to convince the average person that David Crowley was guilty. They failed and they continue to fail. And the reason the case needs to be reopened is because they will continue to fail to prove David Crowley is guilty because they cannot prove it. I truly, honestly believe that. Now, can I prove that they cannot prove it? Yes. If these documents, if what I have, if everything that I've seen is what they base their theory on, unless they have secret knowledge, some hidden information, unless they have things that we're not seeing, yes, I believe we can prove that they cannot prove David Crowley is guilty based on their evidence, based on their documents, based on their photographs, based on their reports, based on their comments, based on everything they have given us. There is no way that the police, that these investigators can look at the documents, look at the photos, look at everything they've given us and say, okay, you will understand now why David Crowley is guilty. They really didn't even try. They were already thinking it didn't matter what they told us. 
we were still going to think David Crowley was not guilty. That's their own fault. And they were monitoring the group page. They were monitoring uh, the Justice for David Crowley and Family Facebook group and the Justice for David Crowley of Gray State Facebook page. So they knew that there were people like me who were not convinced. They put, they lumped people like me into a category where everybody thought that the, that the government killed David and that was it. That's totally wrong and that's totally unfair to real people who were really looking for what really happened here. They did a big disservice to us. So I think they were kind of like, well, it doesn't matter what we tell you, you're still gonna think David Crowley didn't do this. And to me, that made it sound like, okay, so then you're not gonna put any effort into it, right? That's pretty much what you're telling me. And that's what I told, well, I didn't tell Gummer. That's what I, that's what I should have told Gummer is, you're, you just said that no matter what, you think we'll still be con convinced that David Crowley did not kill his wife and his daughter and then kill himself. Even though I've stated publicly many, many times that I'm open to it, that I want to see it. I want the evidence. They didn't even look at that. They didn't even care because it wasn't about that. They, I mean, it, those are the people they should have been focusing on, not the people who were set that the government killed David or that David was part of some global conspiracy or it's going to release some movie that was going to change the whole world or whatever. So they did a very big disservice to the public because they, they did not help us understand. They didn't even take the time really. So anyways, I mean, Gummer did, Gummer at least took the time to answer those questions. He, he, he tried to back out kind of, not really back out, but he, you know, at first he was not going to answer those questions. Um, but he's a man of his, of his word. Gummer is a man of his word and he answered those questions and I thank him for that. Page 26 is ACISS attachment 2015-28-4 report date 126 2015 and this is in regards to the latent prints of David Crowley and the DD214 which is his military record. That was re requested by Chris Olson Status was approved and the approved date is 126, 2015. The record originating date is 126, 2015. It says on January 21st, 2015. Oh, here we go. Here's the FBI thing now. Because it was always, were the FBI involved? Were the FBI, were the Department of Homeland Security involved? Were the FBI involved? Who was involved? So now we have the one mention of the FBI in these documents. I think this is the only mention that you'll ever see. And it's only for Olson to request from the FBI, from the Minnesota FBI, uh, David Crowley's fingerprint card taken by the US military on 6-24-2003. And this FBI agent, Travis Yarberg, sent Olson David's DD-214 on January 21st, 2015. This shows they had David's fingerprint. This is going to be one of the most important things that you're going to read in these documents simply because of they have one match to David's fingerprint, one. And it's on the notebook in the office bedroom. That's it. They don't have a fingerprint. They don't have a palm print of David's on that gun. They can't do it. Now you could say, well, it's, it's because the gun was there for three weeks. You could say it's because of the, of the dog. Whatever you want to say, that is a fact. They could not put the gun in David's hand. That's a big thing. It's a huge thing. It's one more reason to reopen this case, I think. You talk about the smoking gun. The bloody gun might be the smoking gun. Okay, so Olson gets the fingerprint card from the FBI on January 21st. Then on the following day, he receives David's DD-214 from SAIC Michael F. McDaniel. 
So even though we were told that the FBI were not involved, technically they weren't and technically they were, right? They weren't involved in the investigation. There's no proof that they were involved in the investigation, but they were contacted. So semantics, yeah, okay. I'll give them that one. And then page 28 through 31, another ACISS crime scene supplement, 2015-28 slash five. So now we're into the fifth part. Still dated 117, 2015. The crime scene processing. That's what we're gonna be going through here now. The BCA received a call at 1417. They arrived at 1530. Their work was completed on 118 on the following day at 430. The BCA on page 28, you'll see the BCA took 800 photographs. They took a photograph of the exterior, the interior, general area, point of entry, no, point of exit is no, shoe prints, no. That was interesting. Footprints, yes. Tire tracks, no. Tool marks, no. Victim injuries, yes. Weapons, yes. Um, so when you think about just another thing going back to those shoe prints, I, I did notice that comparisons to the officer's shoe prints were made to shoe prints in the snow. And then I wondered, did the police ever compare David's shoes in the sh to the shoe prints in the snow? And then I wondered if the police ever compared David's shoes to the shoe prints in the snow. Page 31 shows Elliot's story. She was contacted by the BCA's operations center and she was requested to respond to the crime scene in Apple Valley. SSA O'Donnell documented the crime scene through video which was recorded onto a mini DVD and which was later transferred to a DVD for easy viewing. So the photos are on a DVD that is marked item point two. Page 32 and 33 cover the Minnesota BCA ACISS attachment 2015-28 slash seven. So now we're in the, to the seventh document associated with this. The report date is 2-13-2015 from 1705 to 1713. Okay, these reports and exhibits are received by the Alpha Valley Police Department. Report by Chris Olson on 2-13-2015. S.A. Olson received 20 PDF files. 20 PDF files. These files included reports and other investigative exhibits relevant to this investigation. If you look at page 34 through 37, you get half a list of the top 200 donors start with number one and it's a big jump from number one to number two okay so page 38 you'll see here we got the training here that Kamel and david took if you're looking at page 40 you'll see Kamel's training verification through quorum security incorporated page 43 has the gun that david gave to danny mason as a gift page 44 Kamel's firearms bill of sale purchased on 725 2009 at the gun zone in Dallas, Texas. She paid with a check, total of $508.76. She bought a Springfield XD 40 caliber, serial number US163310, signed by Kamel. Page 45 through 47. It's David's training verification certificate, course completed on November 8, 2009, and done by the same company, Quorum Security. Page 48 is David Crowley's private firearm transfer to Adam Schambauer. It's dated September 17, 2010. It's given as a gift, and it's from the AR-15. It is the lower receiver, serial number 61242. Page 49 is a private firearms transfer from David Crowley to David Stark, dated June 17, 2012, conducted as a sale. David sold Mr. Stark 
a Springfield XD 40 caliber subcompact serial number US163310. Kamel buys this gun on 7-25-2009 in Dallas, Texas for $508, sells it, or David sells it, to David Stark June 17th of 2012. Page 50 through 133 are the police reports. And here we go again, the police reports. There are some police reports in here and there are some police reports that are missing. The ones that are missing are, look like it's generally the ones at the end of the 94 pages. So that's curious. The last update that we get where the case is exceptionally cleared is not in this set of police reports. That's a big deal. The other interesting thing to notice about this is some of what was censored in the 94 page PDF is not censored here. So there is some good data there. There is some good stuff to actually go through. And it'd be good to have a full comparison of everything about what is blocked out in the original 94 pages and then compare that to what is not blocked out here in these 70 some odd pages that we have of police reports. Page 134, 137 is the BCA lab analysis request by Tommy Booth. The section involved the crime scene team. The estimated due date is 2 17, 2015. The firearms, the estimated due date is 5 18, 2015. Latent prints, the estimated due date 4 18, 2015. The nuclear DNA estimated due date 518 2015 and the question documents estimated due date 418 2015. This is all on page 134. The evidence list begins on page 134 as well and goes through all of the items number 1 through 48. Now you'll notice just 1 through 48 because right now they don't have 49 through 56. And then later they'll have 57. So you, you're going to see this document, three sets of the same document here. Okay. And as we move on to page 138, the AVPD press release. Now we're going to see one, two, three, four, five of these press releases. Note these dates, note these times. This is very important. All right. So on page 138, this is the very first one. This is the first press release, Suspicious Deaths. And you'll note here, it does not mention a double murder or suicide. This was set to release at 3.30 p.m. January 17th, 2015. Little over two hours have passed and the first press release goes out, Suspicious Deaths. Doesn't really say much. Shouldn't say much because they don't know much. This one is dated January 18th, set for release at 1140 AM. This one does mention a murder suicide, but they're very clear to make sure that there's no threat to public safety. To me that shows, and I think this has been brought up many, many times, but just to say it again, it does show that by this time, the police were working with the, the theory that David Crowley was guilty. That's what, that is their working theory. They don't have two bullets yet. They don't have item 53. They don't have item 57. Item 57, obviously, they don't find that one until February 18th when they're told about it by Chris Klein or else they would never have item 57. Thank you, Chris Klein. Think about that for a second. Let's say they never had item 57. This wouldn't match up. Nothing would match up. Of course, only four bullets and six casings found on January 17th does not match up either. So if you're still looking at page 139, you can see based on this, that the medical examiner's office is still working to positively identify the three dead bodies. They haven't identified them yet, and they're already working with the, this theory that David Crowley is guilty. 
Even on January 19th, they don't have a positive ID, page 140. But they're already treating this as an apparent murder-suicide. So maybe they're just being cautious. Maybe that's just legal speak, and they're just making sure CYA. And on page 141, dated 121, 2015, at 3 p.m., now they have a positive ID. So by 121, they have a positive ID. They have already said that they believe that this was a murder-suicide. We can conclude that by 121, 2015, the police are working with that theory that David Crowley is guilty. They're not looking at other theories. They're not looking at foul play. They've ruled out foul play. Okay, page 142 is going to be the fifth and final press release that we're going to see here. And the investigation is still ongoing. Last verified activity from the residents was late December of 2014, according to investigators. Captain John Brumell is actually quoted in this last one. He is quoted, The analysis of these devices could provide important information about this incident, but that analysis will take time. Page 144, 145, and 146 all look like they are trying to identify Kamel. January 18th, 1.49 a.m. Ryan Olson sends Sean McKnight this image on page 145 to identify her by her tattoos. Probably one of the fastest, easiest ways to identify a person, I would think going to move on to page 147. Page 147 shows how they were trying to identify David Crowley through the tattoos. And you will note that date originally sent from Ryan Olson to Sean McKnight on January 17, 2015. Okay, page 150 to 151 is a release form where they are releasing the dog to Dan Crowley Jr. The dog was obviously impounded on 117 2015 It's a mixed breed. It's a male. Dan Crowley Jr. claims that dog on January 21st, 2015, according to these documents here. So this fax that we're seeing here, this document was faxed from the pet hospital to the Apple Valley Police Department on January 21, 2015. You can see that on page 151. On page 152, you will see that on January 23rd, 2015, Tommy Booth is notified that the forensic scientist assigned to the nuclear DNA section assignment in this case will be Rebecca Diane. Page 153 is the handwritten report with a list of authorities involved. This lists everybody who was involved in this case. Page 154 through 157 is Kamel's messages with an unnamed person. The dates include Monday, November 24th at 9.57 a.m., where she met with somebody at a coffee house. Kamel's plans for after the holidays. Quote, I'd also be interested in planning a more elaborate, fun get-together after the holidays. On page 155, she's corresponding with somebody on December 3rd, 12.39 p.m., and she responds on Friday, December 5th at 11.53 a.m. So you can read page 154 through 157 and you can see and you can judge for yourself because we get down to page 156 and now we're in December of 2014. Page 158 shows what guns were taken from the house on January 18th, 2015. There are nine in total. On page 159, you'll see that Brian Bone is trying to get access to David Crowley's Dropbox. He is requesting a preservation of the account and any account associated with this specific Gmail account, crawls04 at gmail.com. Page 160 through 162, we're back to the BCA Forensic Science Service, filled out by the AVPD, Brian Bone. This is for the nuclear DNA test, specifically. Look at what it says under latent prints here. Elimination principles from all principles, no. Major case prints, fingers slash palms for crimes against people, no. Is the evidence process, no. 
DNA cases, known DNA samples from all principles, yes and no. Still on page 161. It clearly says yes and no. Both of those boxes are marked on page 161. Page 162, the elimination principles, names David, Kamel, and Rania. All right, page 164 shows Joe Cooksley as the forensic scientist assigned to the crime scene team. Page 165 shows that Catherine Roach is the forensic specialist assigned to the nuclear DNA section. Page 166 through 318 shows David Crowley's Facebook account activity. Page 319 through 332 is David Crowley's conversation with Brendan J. Look at page 335 and 336 now, and you will see this post that was removed. You won't find this post anymore on David's social media. This was removed, a removed post, page 335 and 336. So the police were able to get a record of this. All right, page 337 shows Sean Wright with Luke Radowski. Again, you gotta ask why. What is going on here? Well, obviously, to the police, page 337 relates to 335 and 336, or it also relates to 338. Check out 338. That's when Sean Wright starts asking for the admin rights. So I was just wondering, when I looked at page 341, I was like, why is this post here? And then I scrolled up to page 340, 339, Now, the, the thing is, if they already think David Crowley is guilty at this point, why are they doing all this? Why are they going through all this stuff? I, I don't know. Page 342 is the email exchange between David and Jason Allen. Now, Jason Allen forwards this email to Sean McKnight on January 20th, 2015. David sent this email on 12-17-2014. He was planning for the future. He was actively planning for his future. How does that equal a suicide? How do they go from planning your future to committing a double murder suicide?
page 345 is a picture of David, Danny Mason, and others on Facebook. Page 346 through 349 is the AVPD property and evidence report. Very important document here. Page 350 is the property and evidence report dated 122, 2015 at 159 p.m. This is the bullet that rolled out of the carpet. It's also listed as item 026 on there. Page 352 is another property and evidence report with the bodies in the bags. This is print dated 127. Page 353 is David's clothing list. Page 354 is the evidence receipt for David's clothing list. Page 356 to 358 is the same thing for Camille, her evidence receipt. Page 362 is the property release form for the same bullet that was found on January 20th that rolled out of the carpet. Very interesting, the item number 53 was found on January 20th. Okay, page 363 to 367, forensic laboratory analysis request for nuclear DNA comparisons for item 50, item 51, and item 52. David's known blood sample, Kamel's known blood sample, and Ryan's known blood sample. They also requested nuclear DNA comparisons for item 53. That was submitted on 123, 2015 at 10.05. Page 368 to 372 is Brian Bone's application for a search warrant and supporting affidavit and search warrant. 373 to 375, Brian Bone slash Sean McKnight receipt, inventory, and return. Now we're getting to the nitty gritty. AV-1 through AV-55. You'll notice on page 373, dated 117-2015, but on page 374, it is dated 117-2014. Simple error, minor error. Here we have 23 through 44. Looking at page 375, going to AV-55. 367 is the receipt of filing search warrant. Contains a copy of the warrant. 378, AVPD Detective Michael Tietz to AT&T National Compliance Center for AT&T, sent on 122, 2015. Page 379 shows AVPD's attempt to contact T-Mobile. Page 380 through 384 is a search warrant application for AT&T phone record 651-333-0072 between the dates of 9114 and 121 2015 signed on 122 page 385 to 389 is a search warrant for AT&T phone record 212-470-5794 between the dates of 11 2014 and 121 2015 page 390 to 394 is a search warrant for the T-Mobile phone 254-616 0461 between the dates of 1 1 2014 and 1 21 2015. Page 395 is a search warrant for the AT&T phone record 612 999 4890 between the dates of 9 1 2014 and 1 21 2015. Page 396 to 399 is when Gummert learns in regards to Rania's school that David and Kamel had multiple emergency contact numbers on file at the school, including the number 612-999-4890. Page 400-404 is Sean McKnight's search warrant for the computers and digital media storage, and the list of items are included. This evidence may show motive, pre-planning, intent, or a recording of the crime itself in video still images or audio form. We know that's not true. 28 devices were found in total. This is the autopsy of David has not yet been started. If you look at page 401, just gonna quickly go to a different document here to refer when the autopsies of David were done. 
Autopsy here says 11.50 a.m. So page one of David Crowley's autopsy says 11.50 a.m. But Sean McKnight's report clearly says the autopsy hasn't even been started yet. And it's signed and dated 1330-118-2015. Okay. Page 405 to 409 is Brian Bone's application for a search warrant and supporting affidavit. They are requesting financial records, Wells Fargo records. On page 407, there's indications of financial trouble from what they say. Detective Bone thought money and debt can be a contributing factor to motive in cases of homicides. He doesn't specifically say this case on page 407, but he mentions that they might have financial trouble. There's indications. What are the indications of their financial trouble? Because people told them that? Page 410 through page 413, David Crowley's financial records warrant and application requested by Brian Bone on 2-2-2015 at 2.13 p.m. They are requesting AAA credit screening and financial records. Page 414 to 418, Kamel's financial records warrant and application. Also requested by Brian Bone on 2-2-2015 at 2.13 p.m. Page 419 to 421, cover David Crowley's Dropbox search warrant and application. This is also requested on the same date. 2-2-2015, 2-13 p.m. by Brian Bone. Page 422 to 427 is the Equifax request from AVPD with the warrant attached. This is requested by Brian Bone on 2-4-2015 at 4-22 p.m. They are specifically requesting financial records for Kamel. Page 428 through 432 is pretty much the same thing, but for David Crowley, it's an Equifax warrant and application. Same date, 2-4-2015 at 4-22. They want David's financial records. So they have this stuff. And we see at the very end of this, again, there is very little proof of any financial trouble from what I can see here. And that doesn't include David's pending deal for his Hollywood project. And it doesn't include the $14,000 check that was left on their front doorstep. And they're still saying that there's indications of financial trouble with the $14,000 check found on the front doorstep. It's hard for me to believe there's indications of financial trouble. Why aren't the police seeing the same thing? Why aren't investigators seeing that same thing? Why did Mason Hendricks not want this to be made public? Did not want this in the police reports that were given to us. He told me that. Because this, this kills that story. This kills the whole theory that they had major money problems. Page 433 is the Apple Valley Police Department Incident Recall Report from Sidra. And this one is dated 10-18-2014. This is when Sidra goes to the Crowley house and is turned away. Does, she wants to go see her sister. She goes there to pick up one of her dad's cars. She does not see her sister. She does not see her niece. She only sees David. From what she says, David won't let her in, won't let her see them. And she's worried. Who wouldn't be worried? You should be worried. This is the second call. This is Sidra's second call to 911. The first call you'll see on page 343. And that one happened same date, 10-18-2014. This call was at 1908. They arrive at 1930, and this is closed at 1951. That's page 434. Take a look at that one. Two calls within two hours. So she's in the lobby of the police office asking for assistance, getting the cars back. The police can't help since it's a civil issue. All right, page 435 to 436. Back to the BCA ACISS Crime Scene Supplemental Report. This is 2015-28-8. The report date is 2-18-2015 from 0 to 0. This is item 57, a bullet found a month later. Police will try to tie this bullet to David's murder weapon. I don't think that they'll be very successful. The call was received at 2-18-2015 at 1630 
The time that they arrived is 1730 and the time completed is 1930. Two hours. Exactly. 28 photographs were taken this third time that they've come into the house now. They recovered a spent bullet, Christopher Olson, on Wednesday, February 18th, 2015. Special Agent Lance Lehman is contacted by the BCA's Operations Center to respond to 1051 Ramsdale Drive. Lance Lehman is briefed by BCA Special Agent Chris Olson, and the purpose of this event was to document and recover a spent bullet from the attic. And the BCA crime scene team was on site as well, including Joe Cooksley, who was there on the first day, on January 17, 2015. He was there and Beth Wolf. Special Agent Lehman took the 28 photos, item 8.1. This is all on page 437. Really good stuff here. The record original date is 219, 2015 at 955 by Lance Lehman. Page 439 to page 442 are the crime scene drawings. Very interesting stuff here, especially when you think about the three different dates and you look at the dates on here. So there's no doubt they had to update this twice. Page 443, the Minnesota BCA ACISS lab result attachment. The report date is 2-3-2015 for nuclear DNA. And this is 2015-28-10. Page 444 is the Forensic Science Laboratory report on the examination of the physical evidence. For nuclear DNA, it lists Items 1 through 53, that's it. That's what they're testing for nuclear DNA in this document at this point, up until this point. Page 446 are the results of the lab exam. This is the blood. Presence of blood is found on the pistol, item 1A, in four areas. It's 1A-1, which is the grip of the gun, 1A-2, which is the slide of the gun, 1A-3, which is the trigger of the gun, and 1A-4, which is the muzzle of the gun. They also find presence of blood on the magazine, item 1B, in one area called IB-1. They find blood on the knife, which is item 8, in four areas, three samples collected, 8-1, which is the blade, 8-2, which is the inside, 8-3, which is the handle. They found presence of blood on the pin, item 40, 40-1, on the grip of the pin. They found presence of blood on the notepad, item 41, 41-1, on the front cover, 41-2, on a page. They found, okay, now, now we're getting into bullet. I'm going to call this bullet 1, item 42, bullet 1. They found blood on the bullet, item 42-1. 42-1 is the actual blood on the bullet. Bullet number two, item 43. They found blood on the bullet, item 43-1. We're still on page 446. And we're going to look at bullet number three, item 44. Blood on the bullet, and the blood on the bullet is labeled as item 44-1. Here's where blood was not found. Blood was not found on 1B1, which is a cartridge. Blood was not found on 1B2, which is a cartridge. Blood was not found on 1C, which is a cartridge. Again, blood was not found on 45, which is a bullet. Page 447 shows the hair and fiber and when they were collected on. Not examined at this time were items 4 through 7, 10, item 13, item 16 through 22, Item 25, item 26, item 28, item 29, and item 31 through 33. This is signed by the forensic scientist in charge, Rebecca Dian. Okay, page 448, Minnesota BCA ACISS lab result attachment, 2015-28 slash 11. This is dated 3-11-2015. Lab number two, crime scene team. Page 449 is a Forensic Science Laboratory BCA result of the field examinations report 2, item 1 through 57. 
Brian Bone requests BCA crime scene team to go to the house to look at the hole in the ceiling and search for any possible related bullet. So Brian Bone calls the BCA, the BCA Operations Center sends out their team on 2-18-2015 to recover item 57. Hours in the house from 1745 to 1945. Page 452 shows the observations of the scene. Page 453 shows the description of the bodies. This is a very important read. Okay, page 454 shows HCME entered the scene at midnight on 118, 2015. The bodies are taken 90 minutes later. Fragments of bones and tufts on the hair were observed on the area rug in the living room. Page 454 is a list of items collected. Item 1, Springfield XD, XD546473 with blood on it. Cartridge cases, items 239, 30, 36, and 37. Cartridge item number 7. Three bullets, 42, 43, and 44. Bullet fragment item 31. Book with blood on it. Item 4. Pages torn out of the book with blood. Item 5, 6, and 10. The knife, open. Locked back knife. Item 8. Page 454 clearly shows that the knife was open. Blood swabs from the wall. A and B. Items 11 and 12. Page 455. Blood swabs from the east wall. Item 29. Blood swabs from the south wall behind the Christmas tree. Item 33. Blood swabs from lower front right corner of the recliner. Item 34. Blood swabs from wood floor outside of area rug. Items 13, 14, 15, 18, 19, 20, and 32. The magazine from item 1 had blood on it. Ridge detail. Loaded with less than 4 cartridges. Also a cartridge in the chamber. Page 456. Item 57 is mentioned. A projectile was traveling generally west to east as it entered the ceiling and exited the attic. From the island counter wall below the countertop, item 16 and 17. Blood swabs of underside the island countertop, item 28. Blood swabs of the laptop's A key, item 24. Blood swabs of the keyboard surface, item 23. Blood swabs from the island countertop next to the laptop, item 25. Blood swab of tissue box, item 26. Blood swabs of cell phone, item 35. The dishwasher was open. Dish racks pulled out. Blood swab of the kitchen floor, item 21. Blood swab inside the dishwasher, item 22. Page 457, items 46 and items 47, the notepad and the note page, possible handwriting samples from Kamel. Page 457, item 48, checkbook from David, possible handwriting samples from David. Blood swab collected in hallway outside of the office, item 27. Blood swabbing of office desk, item 39. Blood swabbing of notepad, item 41. Possible bloody ridge detail and blood on previous page 2. Blood swabbing of pin, item 40. Open safe in the master bedroom. Loaded magazine with keys and miscellaneous items. There is a swabbing of push keys on the top of the safe, item 38. Page 458 is the house diagram. You have the basement wall bullet here. You have the hole in the south wall. Chemical testing failed to detect the presence of lead. Bullet item 45 was retrieved from inside of the wall near the hole in the basement. This is all the basement wall bullet. The bullet hole in the living room was underneath the area rug. Holes were observed in both the area rug and the wood floor underneath that rug. Chemical testing of hole in wood floor failed to detect lead. Page 459, additional items submitted. Item 49 by Special Agent Chris Olson. Item 50 through 53 by Whitney Dorn. Item 54 through 56 by Special Agent Beth Ellers. Nuclear DNA tests were done on items 1 through 45, items 50 through 53, and item 57. Latent prints were done on item 1, item 40, item 41, item 49, and item 54. Firearms, item 1 through 3, item 9, item 30, item 36, item 37, item 42 through 45, item 53, 
and item 57. Question documents, item 41. No analysis at this time was done on items 46, 48, 55, and 56. This is dated 3-11-2015. Page 460, the Minnesota BCA ACISS Lab Results Attachment, 2015-28-12. The report date is 3-16-2015 for nuclear DNA. Page 461 is about Rania Crowley's known blood sample, which is item 52, single source composite DNA profile. Page 464 shows the nuclear DNA tests were done on item 1, the gun, which is 1A and 1B, item 8, the knife, blood swabs for items 11, 14, 23, 27, and 35. Nuclear DNA tests were also done on item 38, the push keys from the gun safe, item 41 from the notepad, item 42, 43, and 44, which are all bullets. Item 45, which is the bullet in the basement wall. This is all nuclear DNA tests. These nuclear DNA tests were also done on item 50, which is a blood sample of David Crowley. Item 51, a blood sample of Kamel Crowley. And item 52, a blood sample of Rania Crowley, page 465. These tests were also done on item 53, the bullet that rolled out of the rug. And item 57, the bullet that police found in the attic. No blood on that bullet. Sampled, collected, labeled as 57-1. Still on page 465, here are the DNA results. Item 1A-3 is a mix of two or more people with major male DNA profile that matches David. Major profile does not match Kamel or Rania. Rania cannot be excluded from being a possible contributor. Kamel is excluded. Item 1B is a mix of two or more people. Major male DNA profile matches David. Major profile does not match Kamel or Rania. Kamel and Rania cannot be excluded as contributors. Estimates 99.95 to 99.97 of the general population can be excluded. Page 466 is item 8-1, which has a mix of two or more people. David Kamel and Rania cannot be excluded from being contributors. 99.95 to 99.98% of the estimated general population can be excluded. Items 11 and items 44-1. Single source female DNA profile matching Kamel. David and Rania are excluded. Item 14, 23, 27, 42-1, and 43-1. Female DNA profile matching Kamel. David and Rania are excluded. Item 35 has a mix of two or more people. Kamel and Rania can't be excluded. David is excluded along with 99.9998% of the general population. Page 466, item 38 which shows a mix of two or more people. Major DNA profile matches Kamel. Major DNA profile does not match David or Rania. However, David and Rania cannot be excluded from being possible contributors to the mixture. Page 467. Item 41-2 has a mix of two or more people. Major DNA profile matches Kamel. Major DNA profile does not match David or Rania. David and Rania are excluded. Item 45-1 shows no DNA profile obtained. Item 53-1 shows a mix of two or more people. Major DNA profile matches Rania. Major DNA profile does not match David or Kamel. David and Kamel are excluded. This is very important right here because item 53-1 is the bullet that rolled out of the carpet on January 20th. What you're reading here shows they did not have the bullet that they will say killed Rania until four days after the bodies were taken out of the house. That's ridiculous. Four days after, January 17th goes by. Bodies are taken out January 18th. January 19th goes by. January 20th, when there's cleaners in the Crowley house, a bullet rolls out of a carpet, lands on the hardwood floor, 
cops are called in to collect this bullet this document on page 467 shows this is the bullet that killed Rania, most likely. That's what it's telling me. They missed this bullet too. The only bullets they found, if their logic is correct, the only bullets they found on January 17th were related to Kamel. Page 467 to 468 covers item 57. There is a male DNA profile that matches David Crowley. Kamel and Rania are excluded. Insignificant genetic information led to no statement on minor types. Page 469 is the autopsy reports. Minnesota BCA ACISS attachment 2015-28-14. The report date is 4-14-2015. This is the final autopsy reports. Page 470 shows that Chris Olson receives the final autopsy reports Final autopsy claims David died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Page 471, the Minnesota BCA ACISS lab result attachment 2015-28-15 with a report date of 524-2015, lab 5-FA. Page 472 covers the forensic science laboratory tests on firearms. Lab 5, there's an item list. This is dated 522-2015. Page 473 shows the results of the laboratory examination. On item one, the gun fired item two, fired item three, item nine, item 30, item 36, and item 37 for a total of six 40 cal Smith & Wesson cartridge cases. Now, item one also fired item 42, item 43, item 44, item 45, item 53 and item 57 for a total of six 40 caliber Smith & Wesson bullets. They find matching features between item 57 and item 31. So item one fired item 31. Item seven was not examined. It's a cartridge. So they take the matching features between item 57 and item 31 to show that item one fired item 31 Examinations of item 42, 43, 44, 45, 53, and 57 showed them to be consistent with bullets from the Winchester PXD1 brand cartridges. You know, when I first read this, I thought it was the other way around. I thought they were using item 31 to help prove item 57 was fired by David's gun. Reading this now, I'm looking at it differently, and now I'm thinking they're, they're trying to say what they found with item 57 helps them prove something about item 31. They don't even know that David's gun fired item 57 and they're going to use item 57 to help prove that David fired item 31. Lisa Kinsella is the forensic scientist here. Page 474 is the Minnesota BCA ACISS lab result attachment 2015-28-16. The report date is 7-2-2015, Lab 6. This includes a list of question documents. It includes 41A-1 to 41A-59. Lots of items to cover here. Okay, page 476, we're talking about blood. Item 41A-20A. -A. Two ESDA lifts taken of impressions found on the front side of page 20 of item 41, the spiral notepad. Item 41A-21A, -A, two SDA lifts taken of impressions found on the front side of page 21 of item 41. So the comparisons will not be done at this time. If you're looking on page 477, comparisons of item 41A-30 and question writings and photographs saved, item 55, will not be conducted at this time. Still in the handwriting now with page 478 with alternate life source examining results. Exams of item 41, front, back, 59 pages inside, failed to reveal any latent writing material. Items 41A-1 through 41A-59. So they go all through these 59 pages. 41A, 41 is the notepad, 41A is the paper, on the notepad and 41A-1 through 59 are the pages. The indented impression examination results are also listed here. 
These impressions were done on 41A-20A and 41A-21A. Limitations. Additional writing impressions were developed that could not be interpreted. Page 480 is the BCA-ACISS lab result attachment 2015-28-17, dated 9-10-2015, September 10th, 2015, done by Lab 7. Page 482 shows the latent prints, dated 7-31-2015. List of items submitted are all from page 482 to 484. This includes the gun, the magazine, the pen, the notepad, 59 pages. Item 49 is a known fingerprint card of David Crowley. Item 54 is a CD with images of 25 NEF images. Item 58 is a disc with images of latent prints from 1A, 1B, 41A, and 54. Latent prints. Item 1A, latent palm print, which is labeled as LP1A-1. Item 1B. Latent fingerprint, which is labeled LP1B-2. Item 54, a latent palm print, labeled LP54-1. File names BCA-499, NEF through BCA-5001, NEF. A limited examination of latent prints is apparent blood from item 41, 41A, 41A1 through 41A59, all submitted as item 41. So on the notepad, they find two latent prints that are suitable for comparison. The latent prints, item 41A-30, latent print impression, could be from a finger or a palm. Item 41A-31, latent fingerprint, LP41A-31-1. It's the blood. Now don't forget, they search in the Moffin database and no suitable candidate was generated for these latent prints. Latent print results, page 485, LP1B-2 is a fingerprint inconclusive to Crowley due to the limited quality and quantity of information in the latent print. LP41A30-1 is a palm or fingerprint inconclusive to Crowley for the same reason there's a limited quality and quantity of information in the latent print. It's not a good enough latent print. LP41A31-1 is a fingerprint of David's left middle finger on the note page. Two palm prints, LP1A-1 and LP54-1, could not be compared due to no known palm print of David, according to page 45. This is dated 7-31-2015, well after they had contacted the FBI and the military. So they have palm prints, but they can't match them to David. They have a fingerprint, two fingerprints. Can't match them to David. Yet they're still going to go and claim that David is guilty. Contact information is left if additional examinations are necessary. I believe they are, so hopefully we can get to that. Contact the BCA latent print section. This is written by forensic scientist Jennifer Kostrowski. The review, they reviewed five latent print results. Three fingerprints, two palm prints. Okay, the three fingerprints, LP1B-2, inconclusive to David Crowley. LP14A31-1, inconclusive to David Crowley, which is the notepad. LP1A30-1 is inconclusive to David Crowley, and this is the note page, number 30. LP41A31-1 has David's left middle finger. This is the only fingerprint that they have is of David Crowley's left middle finger found on the note page, page 31, of the notepad. That's it. It's all they can conclusively say. That's what they have. A left middle finger <laughs> for all of us, pretty much. Okay, palm prints. LP1A-1, no palm print comparison. LP54-1, no palm print comparison. They have no palm print comparison for David Crowley. Fingerprints don't match except for one. 
Don't match the gun. Don't match anything else. Until we meet again, Gray Stage continues. <laughs>